Let's begin the orig- uh, excuse me, original, regular meeting of Des Moines City Council. And uh, Susan, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The record reflects that all council members are present except Dave Kaplan. Uh, do we have a motion to excuse? I'll move. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> motion has been made and approved by four people. <laughs> Tony, is there any correspondence? Uh, no, Your Honor. This time we welcome comments from the public. Uh, please come in and state your to the rostrum here and state your name and address, and please limit uh, comments to three minutes. And the first speaker is uh, Ms. Staub. I'm Renina Staub, 216-2828th and Avenue South, the Mornes, Washington, 98198. I want to complain about the fact that, that when the park was put in, there was no fence around it and all the thrash is coming through it. We absolutely need surveillance cameras up on 29th and 218th. It'll stop the crime. It'll be uh, price effective because you can. You it'll stop uh, uh, all the drug trafficking that is going on throughout the city of Des Moines. The mailboxes are set in the middle of the street. Uh, uh, the boxes are off. They're a total mess. Uh, they should be removed, and, and a community box should put, be put on 216th and 29th. Uh, there was a guy the other day that got, they, uh, uh, there was a bunch of blacks, they took and slammed him down, kicked him in the, in the head, uh, jumped on his head. Um, there were, I, I had, uh, a, a glass guy come today and there was, uh, um, uh, uh, some guys on the corner and, uh, uh, the, the one guy said, uh, uh, I've been dealing drugs since I've been 13 years old. I'm an expert at it. You guys don't know a single thing about dealing drugs. We absolutely need surveillance cameras on it. Um, there was a fight last night on 216th and 29th. I don't even have time to call all the crap that's going on. Uh, there was uh, 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 six guys that were in a, uh, a circle. They were drinking beer and throwing up their hands. And they says, yeah, yeah. The one guy said, should we take him out tonight? And the other guy says, yeah. Well, do you think we should do it tonight? And the other guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take him out tonight. Um, uh, uh, they, they, if uh, you said you would spend $6 million on the airport, I met a guy, gal from Washington, D.C., and she said it was eight, over $8 million that was spent. Um, I honestly believe that you could, could survive to take down those mailboxes Put up surveillance cameras on both ends. Put up surveillance cameras on 28th. Um, uh, I, I don't even call in half of the stuff I see. The other, uh, uh, I believe it was the night before last, there were six of these guys that were in a cor- uh, coming down the street, and one walked on, and then there was two, and the other gave, guy gave him some white paper and unwrapped it and gave it to him, and the, and the five stood up to gather. And they always have one guy standing about uh, 10 or 15, uh, oh, I suppose 30 feet down, and he always watches typical drug deal, and they're all unwrapping this stuff, these little packages. Um, I saw a guy about uh, three, uh, three weeks ago. I don't know who he is. I've got pictures of him. He was there in 1999. I got a picture of him then. And any time he shows up, it's serious trouble. Um, I don't know what... The, what, what he's, he, he's in this drug deal, very nicely, quite neatly dressed. But I tell you, when I see him, my knees get weak. Something has got to be done. You're going to have, you're going to have little submarines coming into that marina, and you're going to wonder what happened to you. It's going to be like Mazatlan. You don't even dare step on the green grass down there. I was down on the dock one time, quite a few times, it was quite some time ago, and I'll never go down on the dock again after what I saw was dealing. Anyone on drugs will kill you, too. Anyone on drugs will kill you, too. We need surveillance cameras. We need surveillance cameras on those streets now. 
not in two weeks. Something is going to happen unequivocally, without doubt. Okay. Three minutes. I said too much, huh? No. no, no, I'm just reminding you of the time. Is there anyone that did not sign up that wishes to address the council at this time? See, now we'll move forward into board and committee reports, and we'll start with Carmen. And if you would, council, would you include your comments in there, too? Let's see. Um, I, I think that there's been enough publicity about it. Everyone probably knows that Governor Gregoire was here on Monday uh, signing a bill down at the Beach Park to help restore Puget Sound. It was um, great weather. Des Moines showed off beautifully. There was an eagle sitting up in a tree at the top of the bluff watching the whole time and little ducks swimming around in the stream right beside us. Um, it was just quite an event. A very Im important level of government people there seeing what kind of a town we have. Um, our Saturday market will be commencing again in three weeks on June 2nd, Saturdays at the south end of the marina from 10 till 2 each Saturday until October, in October. And uh, I think that's all. Okay. Ed. I attended the uh, PIC meeting last night, and there are three items that I think are worth sharing with the council. Uh, the Medic One emergency um, medical service, uh, the, the PIC is currently leaning toward the ordinance 2007-0282 that is a levy of regular property tax for six years, 30 cents a thousand. However, they were unwilling, and, and because they were unwilling to oppose the levy little lift at this time with the county being back and forth on what they're going to do, um, it was tabled until the next meeting. Any, any action on that? Uh, also, pick move for action in, in the June meeting of, of, of a proposed amendment to the, to the King County Charter to establish nonpartisan a uh, 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 districting for nomination in the election of King County executive assessor and, and council members. There was a we, we, there was a discussion, pretty lengthy discussion, and uh, it was brought up last week. So that's why it was postponed for, for action. Uh, uh, it was brought up yesterday. Why it was postponed for action? But it's it's amazing how many people uh, there uh, wanted to keep it. Partisan, and um, it'll be interesting. Interesting to, to, to see what happens next month. I really think, Lisa, I want to be nonpartisan. So I'm assuming the council supports me on that. But uh, if you don't, let me know. Um, nonpartisan. You're supporting the nonpartisan. Nonpartisan, yes. The cities of Redmond and, and Olympia have adopted a sprinkler requirement on all new construction, new homes. The whole. Not, not improvements. I mean, if you build a house or or, or you do, do as, as was done here in the Highline College, you build a whole array of, of uh, homes that are near each other. Uh, any new total construction in, in Olympia or Redmond must have sprinklers throughout the throughout the house. And there are fire departments from all over, including ours, talking about how much safety improvement there is with that and, and, and minimizing the spread from one house to, uh, to another and uh, allowing people to, to uh, leave the home in, in, in a safe manner and minimize the time the fire department has to spend there because of the fire hadn't expanded. Uh, there was, they were encouraging cities to consider doing that in, in general. I know, I know we're in the process of, re of reviewing our, our, um, uh, um, our ordinances, but it would seem to me that a new home certainly might be a requirement. That's it. And by sprinklers, I don't assume you mean lawn. You mean the interior of this house, correct? Yes. I know. Susan? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just want to say one thing, um, and I can't remember what is her name, Mrs. Speaker, that was just here. Mrs. Stop. 
Mrs. Uh, Verdina Staub. Mrs. Staub, okay. Well, I too did receive a call today from uh, Mr. Bill Riley, who has owned property there for 18 years on 29th and 216th. And the reason I got this phone call and simply was he knew me 20 years ago when I started in real estate, which is just amazing. It works for a mortgage company. that. So they said, well, who can we call? Well, they said, well, call Susan. So I passed this on to the council as well. But, you know, um, Tony, I really think it's we've got to do something. I mean, it, even he, I mean, he talked to me for like 25 minutes about what's going on up there, and I did explain to him that we are having an issue filling police positions, which I know is true, and uh, but maybe cameras would be a good idea. But I think, you know, he cannot rent his property. I mean, he's got a fourplex that he cannot get, I mean, quality people in there. And I, I think, you know, I, I maybe since we closed the Redondo Bar and Grill, they've all come back to 216th. I don't know. But, you know, it's just, I think we've got to do something. I mean, I don't know what we can do, but, you know, I was listening to her, <coughs> we can't just, you know, blow this off because this is serious. I, oh, I, I, I did take your email, forwarded it. You had copied the chief on it, but I also forwarded it to Kevin and John O. The chief is out of town for a few days, and I asked them to follow up with Mr. Riley right away. So yeah. at least we'll close that loop. As far as what additional we can do, I can certainly sit down with the chief and find out what is available for us to do. But I know we're spending an awful lot of time up there. We have a lot of, uh, of police officer hours that are going on up there, and there have been several special emphasis activities going on up there, too. Until we get our levy lid lift crew on board and operating as the special unit that we want them to, it's going to be difficult for us to maintain and sustain a special emphasis up there the way we really need to be able to do. Cameras is, is, is one thing that we can do. They're not a panacea, but they certainly do provide a variety of things, including a deterrent to crime because the criminals know they're there. Right. It will help us identify people uh, after the fact in most cases, to be a, a active, re, real-time crime-fighting type uh, facility, you need people that will sit there and watch those screens and cameras all day long to see what's going on and react immediately when they see something. That takes an additional time and expense. And well, maybe you're right. Just having cameras <clears throat> up there might, at least people would say, so, well, gee, I'm on camera. Maybe this isn't a place I want to be at. So I, will f I will follow up with John Owen and Kevin to okay. see how they're doing with Mr. Riley, and the chief and I will talk about what additional we can do until we get our levy lid lift guys all on board. Okay. I think that would be much appreciated. Tony? Well, um, Roger Baker made a comment earlier that one thing that we might be able to plan around was some kind of permit parking on the streets up there. And actually what has happened up there with a lot of the apartment complexes now both patrolling their parking lots and fencing their parking lots off, uh, there's very few people parking in the streets anymore. Uh, if you drive up and down those roads, you'll find fewer cars than there have been in the past. No, but he's and, and, I, and I can talk to him about uh, how we would implement that and if it would make any difference or not. But most of the people that are creating problems, as Mrs. Staub talked about, are, are hanging around in the street. And we have been using some of our city code uh, prohibitions against some of those things um, to try to curb that. But a lot of it is cars is driving through, looking for their connection, stopping, doing their deal, and then moving on. And the parking ordinance isn't going to do anything with that. But again, we can throw that out and see what might, how that might work. And, and, it may, and, and because they, they, they stop and, and deal and, and drive off again, it makes it very hard for police to respond to a call. You've got to be there when it happens. And if the cops are there, <clears throat> they're not going to stop. And well, I think the chief has made it very yes. uh, apparent to all of us that right now it's a staffing issue and once those people are brought on as a result of the levy lid left and trained uh, narcotics unit if you want to call them that or, I know. Uh, they have their own tactics which is not what's being used right now we're talking kind of band-aid approaches here mm -hmm. but he's talking about you know infiltrating uh, surveillance uh, all that kind of stuff that trained teams are going to be out there to tackle. So I think anything we discuss right now probably would be a bit of a Band-Aid. 
Yeah. Well, but I, I mean, was, something, anything right now would be better than what is. I mean, and, and the cameras might be a, a way to to do that. It may act it may act as a psychological deterrent. Well, Tony, uh, so you all put this kind of and respond to Mr. Riley and. I'll we'll, we'll definitely follow. Okay. Up. All right. Okay. So. Um, Okay, besides that, um, yes, the event in Beach Park was absolutely wonderful. The weather was incredible. Um, we were able, Patrice and I, to spend an, almost an hour with Dr. Jeff Konings, who's the head of the Fish and Wildlife Department, and his staff, uh, walking around the park, looking at the issues that we're dealing with with the creek, and, you know, so we can hopefully meet that window that we need to um, dredge that and, and they were just so we took them all the way under the bridge the new bridge project and I mean they couldn't believe how incredibly wonderful the whole project is and what that's going to be there so uh, the project has a lot of great momentum it's the Marine View Drive things just beautiful so um, so that was really great I thought was great that they took the time to spend with us to do that and uh, and that was really positive I also did attend the uh, Seattle King County Association of Realtors Housing Issues Briefing at the Kent Library, which was for local electeds mm -hmm. and people who are going to run for office uh, about the ha housing crisis, and it was extremely informative. And um, how, you know, we're addressing affordable housing. Well, there's nothing really affordable, but still, Southwest King County is, believe it or not, the most affordable. But, of course, um, you know, they looked at projects. Uh, you know, there's one that they did up in um, Seattle. I can't remember all the names, but exactly. But there's a um, website called therightsizehome.org, I think it's called. But it really shows how they're doing some of these projects. And we've looked at them. We've got one going on, a couple, I think, in our own city, that, but building, you know, on smaller lots. And they are more affordable. I mean... So that's kind of the way things are going. But they said that just to catch up with the housing shortage, you would have to build two houses every day in each city to just keep up with the housing shortage because there's that many people with jobs and moving here that there is not affordable housing for. So that was kind of interesting. So I do have copies of this or one. I gave one to Carmen if anybody else is interested. Um, so let's see. Um, I did send the council also. Um, I was contacted by um, Mr. Prentice from Mount Rainier High School. Uh, and I also, it was Mr. Pace, who's the husband of the principal at Mount Rainier High School, who I talked to at the real estate briefing. And they're looking for perhaps a partnership, something maybe we can do to put this, you know, this track in at Mount Rainier High School. I sent the council all the information, maybe that Bob can, we can put that on the agenda for discussion. Um, it seems like a good idea to me, but I don't know where everybody else might come from. And then we did have our economic development meeting on Friday, and that was great. It was good to have that kind of back on track. And uh, so I think we're on track on that. So that's, those are my comments and committee reports. Yeah. Okay, I've been in meetings all day. So uh, I was at a, the Seattle King County Public Health meeting, which was held in SeaTac earlier this afternoon. And if you remember, my report from the last one was that um, the percent of HIV cases in South King County is going up and, you know, Seattle going down. Um, but the good news today is that uh, we had a talk on diabetes. And um, as everyone knows, diabetes has a relationship to many things, including uh, weight and um, exercise level. And it turns out that um, the public health looks at areas. Uh, Des Moines is uh, lumped in with Normandy Park and Burien as, a, as, a, as an area that they, they consider. And um, we have uh, one of the lowest diabetes rates uh, in our district, about the same as uh, Kirkland, Mercer Island, and that was in Issaquah. We were all the lowest uh, for diabetes rates. Oddly enough, 
we were like everyone else in the obesity and lack of activity level. So I'm not sure what it, what it results from, but we have a low diabetes rate in town. Maybe people are just getting themselves treated better or something. Okay, that was that meeting. Um, Dave was gone, so uh, he asked me to uh, chair the Public Safety and Transportation Committee meeting, uh, which we had with Ed Pina and a variety of staff. Um, we, boy, we had a huge agenda for that. Um, just to let you know uh, some of the items, and uh, the, one of them was the Saltwater Park Bridge repair work, which I think everyone's interested in. Um, it looks like the, uh, the temporary work, which is filling with um, some concrete slurry, uh, that should be done by June 15th. Um, and is kind of, you know, in, in process. Uh, the more definitive st uh, phase, which is phase two, where we have to put the, um, uh, pardon? Sheet metal in and, and all the, the expensive stuff. Um, that's going to be a permanent fix for the project. Uh, you know, the estimated construction completion time is October 8th, but we still don't have, uh, you know, the guarantee from the federal government for their over $1 million for this project, which we're depending on, um, because we don't have that kind of money. Maybe the port will give it to us. No, no. <laughs> All right. I just noticed them there in the, in the audience. And uh, <laughs> the economic engine of the, of the area, of the whole region. Okay. So uh, we're waiting to hear from them, and, you know, maybe we can get it done a little quicker. We did get as you all know, the um, $350,000 from state transportation that I think Karen Kaiser was reminding us about last week. So that's our portion. That'll cover our portion. So that's good news. Um, the next topic we went over was the um, survey of condition of streets. You know how we do our street repair projects every year. Um, and we've been told that we're woefully underfunded to keep our streets maintained, which is true. And so this was a current report. Um, some information will be coming back to you over time, uh, but just some interesting facts. The, uh, you know, the value new of our streets is about uh, $83, 84000000 million, which is the largest single asset, I think, that the city owns. So it, it is incumbent upon us to take care of our streets, and it gets uh, exponentially expensive to uh, to. Uh, reconstruct a street as compared to repairing it or doing some preventive maintenance. Um, we have some scenarios about what we can do. Um, given the amount of money that we've estimated we're going to be setting aside for our budget that we've already talked about over the next six years and extending out some of that, thinking like to 12 or 13 years, um, but using similar amounts which are sort of underfunding, we had two options to look at in terms of uh, ways to approach the streets. One of them would be to add a little more preventive ma maintenance in than we currently are looking at, um, rather than just the uh, uh, putting the overlays on. There are some other little things we can do for preventive maintenance, and we gave them some guidance on how to get the most money for our the most uh, benefit for our money. And uh, okay, the next uh, topic we had was. Uh, <coughs> The six-year transportation improvement plan, we look at this every year. You'll be getting this on June 14th, I believe. There aren't a lot of changes to it. We've taken out the projects that we've uh, completed and um, at the very end added one project. Now we're you know, talking about six years out um, for finishing off the sidewalks downtown that we never completed that were some east-west uh, sidewalks. So you'll be getting that on June 14th. Um, we had an update on SR 509 plans, and as you know, this is going to be in the RTID. Um, the current estimates now for doing the project is is a little over a billion dollars, but that's what it was when I was last on the SR 509 committee, so it's still the same. But the amount in RTID is $870 million. The port, who is here, um, is uh, going to kick in a couple of extra million dollars, 25 of them, um, to help with the project. And uh, uh, 
the project is still essentially as uh, as we know it. But uh, they're going to have to squeeze some more money out of this in order to finish that project uh, to go from the 870 million or with the ports addition 895 to the 1 billion. And um, I know they're talking about some methods for doing that. One of the things that has been discussed, Julia Patterson has been going around asking if the cities that where the construction is going to go on would um, forego their portion of the sales tax. And I don't know if she's asked the county or not. That was a question someone put to me, if they would also forego their portion of the sales tax, just so that there would be more money that could go into the project might also be a good um, a good demonstration to all the other projects that are in the RTID. Um, you know, maybe the people in Kent and Auburn for the 167 project might might uh, want to look good if the other cities do that. So something will be coming back to us. We don't know how much of it uh, is involved with our city because. Uh, it may not be any, but we'll, we're going to find out about that. Something may be coming back to you on that matter. Um, and then the last thing was an update on transit now, uh, which is we all in the county passed a levy to pay for this. It's some extra metro bus service. And uh, what are we going to see down here? Well, in several years, there's going to be uh, something called Highway 99 South Rapid Ride, which is going to be 10 every 10 or 15 minutes along 99 between the uh, Federal Way uh, Transit Center and the what will be the new Tequila, I guess, Transit Center, which is going to be one of the points where uh, light rail will be coming. Uh, that service is going to go between the two and run every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, also, there are some plans around that time or even later uh, uh, for some modification of the uh, Route 121 service to maybe increase that service, which is a commuter service and goes on 509, so it goes fast. It doesn't make a zillion stops. Uh, that may replace the portion of Route 131 that goes through Des Moines, but it would still go on that route. It would be available for Des Moines riders and might uh, provide a little more convenience uh, and run uh, more frequently than the uh, 131 does. And then the uh, Route 166 uh, may come down and, and uh, extend all the way to the Burien Transit Center, which it doesn't do now. Um, and that would uh, replace some of the Route 132 service, but it would provide more frequent service. So every half hour instead of every hour. Those are all changes for the future, but that's what's uh, in the transit now. Um, grist mill uh, or plans. And then we had put in front of us on our desks uh, some information about the uh, SR99 project that's going on now in the Federal Way area between South 284th and 276. It does affect people in our city because a lot of people come out from our city and go out to 99 there. Um, and this is a project again of uh, WashDOT is actually the the principal um, manage, management for this project. Um, so if our residents have any uh, questions, uh, they should be directing those questions to WashDOT. Uh, and the contact person is Jose Prieto, P-R-I-E-T-O. Phone number is a 206 number, 786-2490. And he can be emailed at PrietoJ, all one word, at washdot.wa.gov. Thank you very much. Hey, Dan, looks like you had a slow day. That's why uh, I was making my jokes early today. It's like 10 o'clock when you're ready. <laughs> Scott? I have no committee reports. Tony, any, any admin reports? Uh, Your Honor, I just want to point out to Council that I put a copy of a memo from uh, Robert Ruth, our Development Services Manager, in your box regarding the Zenith Viewpoint uh, project. If re you recall, we had uh, some citizens show up a few weeks ago asking some questions about it and in particular having to do with the survey and where the right-of-way line was and where their, their uh, fence lines were. This memo talks not only about that, but it talks about uh, street vacations um, <clears throat> by operation of law, um, a variety of things. But 
the bottom line here is the survey that the developer is using looks good. The property owners uh, who were complaining said that they were going to get another survey to see if there was any problems. As of right now, we have not heard anything about that uh, other than it was supposed to have been done today, but we didn't even see any uh, corner markings put out there. Hopefully it will be done tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> everything looks like it's in order and that project is ready to start going forward. But the memo from Robert is extremely detailed. I encourage you to read it. If you have any questions, please contact me, Robert, or the city attorney, and she can talk to you about some of the right-of-way issues. And that's all, Your Honor. Okay. I believe you have a presentation uh, stated at Port of Seattle. In, I do. Um, Mr. Edwards, you'll be making that presentation for us? I sure will. Good evening, Bob. Right here. Okay. Um, well, good evening, Mayor Sheckler, council members, and, uh, you know, Based on the weather outside, it's wonderful to be here in uh, beautiful sun-drenched uh, Des Moines today. So, uh, because it's certainly is sunny out there. Um, thanks for letting me come and, uh, on behalf of our Port Commission, uh, share this State of the Port uh, report with you. Uh, just a brief update on uh, some of the happenings at our port. Um, your port. This last year, the port saw nearly 30 million passengers uh, travel through SeaTac Airport. There were uh, actually fewer operations because uh, those are more passengers on larger aircraft. Um, that's a, that's kind of a nice trend. I don't know if that'll stay that way, but uh, it's it's kind of an, it's nice to have a few fewer operations. We also handled uh, two million container cargo containers. I know about seven years ago we were at 1.4 million, so we've had about a 50 percent growth in seaport seaport cargo uh, over the last seven years. Uh, we also had uh, close to 200 cruise ships call at the Port of Seattle, carrying uh, 735,000 pass passengers. And uh, similar to aircraft, the cruise ships are getting larger. And this year, we expect to have uh, a few more operations than that, uh, and uh, over 800,000 passengers, uh, cruise passengers at the Port of Seattle. Some of the major projects, uh, major things going on, we now have, or will have in June, new nonstop service to Paris, and uh, shortly thereafter we're going to have new nonstop service to Mexico City. Uh, so that's kind of our gateway to the rest of the world, and we've just added uh, uh, major service to two uh, major capitals. Uh, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. The third runway is uh, still on track to be uh, paved this summer and completed in 2008. And, uh, uh, very excited! I'm very excited about the fact that Sound Transit will complete the light rail link to the airport in 2009. And I should say light rink to the light rail link to the airport and beyond because that's the eventual goal. And um, the other exciting thing, of course, uh, is the partnership with the City of Des Moines on the Des Moines Creek Business Park project, which I think you're going to be uh, discussing later on this evening. Um, uh, um, and I know you're very much aware of all this, but I thought I'd just uh, do a tally of all the things. We uh, have jointly comp completed the uh, environmental impact statement uh, just this March. There's a second development agreement that's being prepared uh, to ready the site for redevelopment that should be completed this summer. Um, I was here, I think, when you – when. I, th I think at the time when we were working on the first one. Um, the developer selection process is going to begin soon and is supposed to be completed this fall. Uh, and we're looking forward to the city partnership in this process, of course. And if all goes well, the real estate market remains healthy. Um, we look forward to development starting as soon as late next year. And from my perspective, having just driven down past that property, uh, it's none too soon. It's time to get this taken care of and get those fences down. Um, just an update on what's been going on with uh, the with King County and the Port of Seattle. The Port of Seattle is uh, has uh, this this is on the east side uh, rail Boeing Field swap. Um, well, what would happen is uh, just as it's been proposed, the Port of Seattle would buy the east side rail, rail corridor and then also set aside funding uh, that would potentially turn that uh, uh, at least allow for that to be used as recreational trail. Um, there's a lot of interest in. Uh, future uses of that as a uh, high capacity transit corridor in the future. So there's still details to be worked out there. King County would then transfer ownership of Boeing Field over to the port. And uh, the port, and one other part about this is the port and the county commissioners uh, really need to look carefully at the elements of the deal. And that's what's been going on now. Uh, we need to be able to look skeptically. And yet, I think conceptually, this is a, a great opportunity for the region to uh, grab that uh, rail corridor 
and at the same time uh, and keep that in public ownership and at the same time uh, to put both airports under one airport authority it just seems to make a make good government sense but there's a lot of details and that's what we're going to be spending a lot of time on um, there's also some freight mobility aspects to this land swap and uh, these are the parts that are not talked about as often there's a intermodal, intermodal rail yard that uh, would accommodate both the ports of Tacoma and the port of Seattle uh, somewhere south prob probably south of Auburn uh, there's also the crowning of Stampede Pass that would allow for double stacked container trains to uh, use Stampede Pass as well as they now use uh, 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 Stevens Pass. And frankly, uh, for the region, the biggest constraint that we have on being able to handle more cargo at both our ports is the rail capacity. Uh, that's uh, the, the bottleneck is really with with rail capacity so those are all parts of this overall deal. Um, some other big news this year for the port is uh, we have a new CEO. Uh, Tay Yoshitani has taken over after 15 years with McDinsmore uh, as, the, as the chief executive officer. And uh, Tay was uh, chosen unanimously. Uh, we did, agreed that we were going to um, regard it as a unanimous choice uh, uh, from the beginning of our process, but it, it actually was unanimous. And he comes with a lot of uh, port uh, experience with Port of Los Angeles, the uh, Port of, Bel of Baltimore, as well as the Port of Oakland, um, and both on the aviation side and the seaport side. Um, let's see the other um, of course you know what does the port do for the region or what is there that that, uh, that the port affects the region what what ways well it's creation of jobs new jobs uh, it, it the uh, diversity that the port brings to the economy um, there's about uh, this is based on an economic study that was done in 2004 uh, but it showed that there was about 12 billion dollars of, re of uh, business revenue and that includes both the airport and the seaport that is related to uh, the existence of the port and and you could probably carve out the airport separately from that and uh, and the seaport I know there's 600 million dollars in state and local taxes generated by all that activity and if you actually made that separation because the, the airport would be here anyway uh, the seaport is probably the part that's more discretionary, and uh, uh, there's about 200 million of that 600 million dollars that is is here because of seaport activity. That's and that generally is the part of the port that's supported um, as far as the capital projects with regards to the tax levy. And this, all these activities result in about uh, 20,000 direct jobs. Um, there's nearly 200,000 jobs though that exist in one way or another because of the port and um, we are very specific about how we invest the port tax money the uh, port utilizes utilizes the uh, tax levy for the debt on the general obligation bonds most of which was used for uh, development of the of the seaport and uh, and a lot of the environmental remediation that we've had to do uh, we use uh, tax money for direct environmental restoration and um, we also uh, in a uh, and, and we've spent about a billion dollars uh, over the past uh, decade to upgrade our and expand our cargo terminals. Um, and this is important in this region because, as we often hear, that there's about one in three jobs that are tied to international trade in our state. We're the most trade dependent state in the nation. The uh, tax levy is never spent on any operations, but uh, we and it's not spent on the airport except in one area that I think is critical. And I'm I'm proud of being part of of moving this forward and that's the uh, 50 million dollars that the port is spending on the uh, on the high highline uh, school district uh, expansion and rebuilding of schools and that's partnered with the FAA about 50 million dollars from the FAA 50 million dollars from the state at least uh, the state has been there every year with their part in this uh, their contribution and more importantly it's the uh, the citizens that um, that are the taxpayers for the highline school district that that voted to put into place the levy that matters uh, that money also and um, it's something I feel pretty pretty uh, good about and I'm, I, I think it's a great use of tax money and I know that um, I've talked to citizens all over the county that think that this was the right thing to do and and still support that um, the environment is another key initiative for us we uh, take great great pride in a lot of the environmental things that we do as you may know the airport service vehicles and the entire tax of taxi fleet now are uh, run on natural gas the seaport maintenance vehicles and many of the cargo handling uh, vehicles burn biodiesel. Uh, American President's Line, one of our uh, major shipping customers, just recently announced that when they're in port, they're going to only burn low sulfur uh, fuel when they're right in the harbor. 
and uh, that's going to reduce the uh, the uh, diesel particulate matter by about 75 percent. And it's a, it's a very important thing because of the people that are working around uh, the, the the harbor that are are right there and otherwise otherwise are subjected to those emissions. We also did a new uh, air emissions uh, marine air emissions inventory, uh, and we we carried this out throughout. Uh, all of Puget Sound, uh, the Straits, and all the way to the Canadian border, and actually they're doing something similar up in Canada to try to look at um, at what sources of marine-related uh, air emissions, including rail, uh, uh, are really out there. It's a it's a it's a baseline inventory, and that we can then use to move move ahead with uh, with whatever we can do to try to reduce some of those emissions. I think that's something that. Um, it's a, it's an opportunity for us down in California. It's uh, uh, they're they're out of compliance and they're stuck. Uh, they have to do some of the things that they're doing to clean up air, uh, the air emissions. There, we've got an opportunity to be ahead of the of the game here, and I think it's uh, it can really be uh, it's a chance for our port to be the cleanest and the greenest and the healthiest port, and it's a competitive advantage I think for us. Um, also, significantly environmental things that we've been doing the. Um, Restoration of about 80 acres of buffer and wetland along M Miller Creek. The protection and restoration of 30 acres of, of buffer and wetlands along Des Moines Creek. And the uh, the other thing that I'm I'm glad we're doing is the establishment uh, establishment of the $300,000 grant program for restoration projects in the Miller and Demine, the Des Moines uh, Creek Basin. Uh, we're also doing some off-site re uh, wetlands uh, replacement and. Um, lastly, uh, this last at the end of 2006, there were over 300 million gallons of stormwater connected to the third runway project that uh, were treated rather than just being uh, released, and uh, you know, we're constantly moving to try to improve that. Um, with regards to economic impact of the 20,000 employees that uh, or 20,000 jobs at SeaTac, uh, that includes the airlines and the concessions, 1,061 of those employees live in Des Moines. I don't know how they come up with those figures, but they have it down to 1,061 uh, employees live right here in Des Moines. Um, some of the other projects that we're working on, the Fast Corridor, which is the grade separation projects with the rail, uh, separating rail and road, and uh, we're breaking ground on one of those, the East Marginal Way grade separation, a little later this year. Uh, we're also supporting the completion of uh, SR 509, the missing link to I-5, and the $25 million, which is actually represented by property, I guess, that the port is is acquiring and, uh, and, and uh, contributing to that project. And uh, also the expansion of 518, which is moving ahead. As a matter of fact, we just approved the $10 million out of $30 million uh, port contribution to 518. That's and that is mostly airport money um, that's going to ease congestion near the airport and and help with that link to I-5 and 405. And we're working with uh, the City of Seattle and Department of uh, Transportation to move freight through the Stadium District in Seattle and on what's called SR 519. It's uh, been something that's uh, was was half of it was built a number of a couple of years ago, and we've been trying to work out the negotiate and work out the way to get it done for the uh, uh, the other half. Let's see. Um, lastly, I think. Uh, I just want to mention that the port also works hard to provide local school children an opportunity to learn about our airport and seaport operations. And 125, another one of these figures, uh, I don't know where they get these, but 125 participants from Des Moines attended our Sea Air School. And that includes working with the, uh, the international trade class or the harbor crews that we, we have or uh, the Odyssey Maritime Discovery Center. In all, the Sea Air School impacts about 10,000 students. Uh, so there's everything from the real big projects to things involving uh, school kids uh, that the port is involved in. And uh, I hope we can just do more of it, do it better, and, uh, and do it in a healthy way. And I'd be willing to answer any questions. More importantly, I've got Mark Griffin and, uh, and uh, Marco Milanese here who uh, can act as a resource. And I know that later on when you're having your session that Mark Griffin is going to uh, stay around if there's anything that comes up that he could answer. Council, do you have any questions for Bob or staff? Well, Bob, looks like you're going to get it. I have one question. Well, you were a little slow there, Dan. I know. Uh, uh, Long day for him. It, it's yeah. not necessarily directly related to Des Moines, but it has to do with the port um, and bike trails. Um, you mentioned something about, about uh, trails. Uh, on uh, West Marginal Way, due south of the Spokane Street Bridge, um, there's a discontinuity in the uh, Green River, Duwamish River, or the I guess it's Duwamish River Trail there. 
I was told that the port was going to be working with uh, the city of Seattle and the Cascade Bicycle Club to fix that very dangerous uh, section where bike riders actually have to ride in the middle of West Marginal Way. So, any word on that? You found one that I don't have an answer for, and I didn't know. Because the port about. owns a lot of the properties there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think you know the area I'm talking about. Yeah, and I don't know if maybe that was related to some of the East Marginal other work that they're doing, possibly. But, but we'll get an answer back to you. And uh, so you stumped me on that. That's for sure, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Since we are asking questions, it was my understanding that the 50 million the port gave to the school district was part of the noise mitigation, where, where the the state and the federal government and 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 uh, and, and the port contributed. So they could modernize schools and sound insulate them or build new buildings. Is that right? Yeah, it was a um, it was a combination of uh, of the school district um, and and there, of course there's a levy that was passed. I think it was a pretty exciting thing to have that uh, levy passed. But the uh, the port, if the levy was passed, the port was going to be on the hook and was going to pay the money. Um, Got to give a lot of uh, credit to Congressman Adam Smith who. Uh, leaned on the FAA, I would say, to make sure that they would allow the FAA $50 million, uh, which was mitigation money, would have gone purely for, I don't know, uh, uh, purely for insulation of older existing structures and had real limits on what it, how it could be used. But Adam Smith uh, uh, really put on the pressure to allow it to be used in a much more constructive way. Um, but that money would have been there anyway. Uh, the uh, let's see, the state of Washington was a was a great participant in this, and I'm, I'm well, the governor and and a, and a number of others I think were uh, were weighing in on that to help make that happen. And of course, every what every session of legislature it could change, but they've stuck, they've they've stayed there and and put in their money. It's you know, it's not from the port standpoint, it was going to be five million dollars a year for ten years, and uh, and. Uh, but it's not spent that evenly, and it's the projects don't get done quite that same way. So some years it's more, some years they p play catch up, and, sp and uh, or yeah, some years it's a little less, some years they play catch up, and they spend a little more. But overall, it's that 50 million, 50 million, um, 50 million from the state, and then a larger amount basically from the from the school district. But the idea is to uh, don't just replace, uh, do something with an old structure if you can build something entirely new that's going to be a lot better and create a better learning um, learning environment for for the students. And I think I believe that's what's been done. And there have been some school openings. It certainly, it certainly is being done that way. Sorry about I, the long answer. Oh well, but the thing is, one of the reasons Des Moines is getting a whole, just about every school is, is a new school. I mean, in, in, in Des Moines is, is because this funding and, and the district funds al allowed them to tear down like Mount Rainier and rebuild a whole new facility. Um, and so that's, that's happening. I remember it all quite well. <laughs> Carmen? I, I wanted to ask if you could clarify a little bit that the local paper had an article about the 509 costs being cut because the port is going to sell some land to the Department of Transportation, um, the $25 million that you mentioned. H how will that change the process? Will it speed it up any, or will it fill in missing gaps of land that they needed to acquire to make the route more complete? Is um, let me take a stab at it, and I might even turn to Marco or, or Mark. I'm not, well, Marco probably in this case. but. Um, you know, I, for a number of years, I was going to the 509 uh, uh, advisory committee, um, uh, executive committee, I think we were calling it, and uh, uh, and then uh, just the start of this year, Lloyd Hara took over, and Lloyd missed a meeting. John Creighton showed up, and and next thing I know, there's a press release out. So <laughs> I don't know, one meeting, and he's and uh, working miracles there. But actually, it was my understanding is that uh, the property was going, it was property that was. Either going to be acquired by the airport or was acquired by the airport, and there was some FAA. Uh, this is FAA related money. There was some FAA re, uh, restriction on how what they could do on that, and they somehow found a pathway to be able to contribute that to the project and not require to be not require uh, reimbursement on that. And I, as I understand it, that's that's how that all came together to basically lower the cost of of that project um, overall. 
I mean, that's that's how I would interpret it. So I'm I'm only I'm I, I probably have a, not much more than what you have of having read it in the newspaper and seen the the press release that the port and uh, Julia Patterson issued. Thank you. Any other questions? Once again, thank you, Bob. Appreciate okay. you coming over this evening. Thank you. And uh, lovely. I'm going to go out in the, in the wonderful I, night. And I don't blame you one I'll bit. you for what you're doing here tonight. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. This time I'll ask the city clerk to read the consent calendar. Okay. Item number one, motion is to approve the regular minutes of April 5th and 12th, 2007. Item number two, findings. Vouchers audited and certified by the auditing officer as required by RCW 42.24.080 and those expense reimbursement claims certified as required by RCW 42.24.090 have been recorded on a listing which has been made available to the City Council. Motion as of this date the Des Moines City Council by unanimous vote does approve for payment those vouchers and payroll transfers included in the above list are further described as follows. Claim checks number 108921 through number 10911 and electronic fund transfers in the total amount of $759,835.35. Payroll fund transfers in the total amount of $328,563.15. Item number three, motion is to approve the draft agreement with Data Bar Incorporated to provide billing services to the marina and to authorize the city manager to sign the agreement substantially in the form as submitted. Item number four, motion is to authorize payment of registration and travel expenses of approximately $498 for Council Member White's attendance at the Association of Washington City's annual conference in Tacoma, June 12th through the 15th, 2007. Item number five, motion is to authorize additional expenditures from Fund 404 for the Marina CCTV security camera project in the amount of $2,500. Item number six, motion is to award the contract for professional engineering services for the Lower Des Moines Creek Hydraulic Evaluation to Tetra Tech slash KCM Incorporated in the amount of $58,011 plus a 10% contingency and authorize the city manager to sign the contract substantially in the form of submitted. Dennis, and number seven. Dennis, I'll go ahead and read seven. Okay, seems how you're sure. part of it. Thank you. Okay. Item number seven is draft resolution number 07-097. The title, a resolution of the city of Des Moines, Washington, recognizing millions of public employees at the federal, state, county, and city level and dedicating and declaring the week of May 7th through May 11th as National Public Employee Recognition, Recognition Week in the City of Des Moines and recognizing the following city employees that have 20 or more years of service. Those people are Jerry Ellingson, 32 years, Dennis Staub, 32 years, oh, Joe Jewell, 26 years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very early for you this evening. Bonnie Holcomb, 27 years, John O'Leary, 28 years, Jerry Nettles, 28 years, Steve Wheeland, 25 years, Kevin Tucker, 24 years, Dave Bell, 24 years, Sonny Williams, 24 years, Janet Beek, 23 years, Dave Mar Marish, 23 years, Sue Bowman, 22 years, Bradley Rogers, 22 years, Frank Olson, 21 years, Bob Collins, 21 years, Ross, is it Stuth? Yes. 20 years, and there's a uh, Vicki Sheckler in there that made 21 years. So, Dennis, back to you. Motion is to approve draft resolution number 07097. That concludes the consent calendar, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there any council member that wishes to uh, remove an item from the consent calendar? C3 will start here. Uh, no, I don't want to remove an item. I just want to thank the people who've had such uh, long service with the city for sticking with us through thick and thin. And, um, you know, it's, it's always uh, heartwarming to see people who've stayed with an organization for such a long period of time because they really are the foundation of the organization. They're the ones who, they're the ones who know where all the reports are. 
are put <laughs> and where to where to find things. And uh, is that a nice way of saying bodies buried? They're the ones who know the history of the organization and provide us with that foundation. So I want to thank all of those people you mentioned and all of the employees who will be on this list in the near future. All right, very well, Dan. Ed, did I see your hand? Yes. Um, I want to comment that, in addition to what Dan said, that these people are what have, what, and their experience and knowledge is what has kept our city functioning during this time of crisis when we had when we had the big uh, drop in staff and budget cuts. I do want to make a comment uh, on item number four. Go ahead. Uh, that I think the council should now recognize because that our travel budget for the council for the year with this expenditure is just about expended. I, I'm not against it. I'm just saying in our, in our planning for travel, should, we should know that that's the situation. Mm -hmm. What is the balance, Tony? Do you know? Close to a thousand or less. I, last time I looked, I think it was less than a thousand. Mm -hmm. So there's still some available for another couple of small chairs, but I'm going to be Well, wait a minute. That's okay. Didn't Susan help me out here? Didn't we just approve one for you to go to the NLC conference? That was on the agenda a few weeks ago. And how much does that go for? It's close to two thousand dollars. Okay, nothing personal, Susan, but I, I got to be fair to the rest of the council. If that's what it's bringing us down to, we can do one of two things. Uh, we got to stop here for a while or we raise that budget item, one of the two. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Uh, well, this is a good opportunity. You know, I feel we've gotten value. Uh, we, we've limited the travel budget. It was the right thing to do. Um, that means everyone has to think when they're taking a trip, is this really going to bring value to the city? I do believe that um, we've gotten value uh, on the, the trips that people have taken. Uh, when they've come back and given reports, I feel that their, uh, their participation has been useful. Information we've gotten back or communications we've had with others, whether it be the trip to Washington, D.C. or other AWC meetings or other meetings that council members have gone to. So I'm, I'm satisfied that we're getting value. I guess the thing to ask would be, are there council members who've wanted to go to meetings and haven't? Um, you know, that's my concern. Yeah. That's really the issue. And I certainly, I haven't gone to any meetings this year that I think have cost the city anything of any expenditure, a couple of dollars here and there for, um, so I go to suburban city meetings. But that's not taken out of this budget. Okay. Um, yeah, those are for the meals as part Correct. of the meeting. Uh, but I have no great desire to uh, to take a trip that's going to cost a lot of money, so I'm all right uh, if Sue wants to go on a trip, and I believe she's brought value back for the trip. Okay, I'm going to consider this item pulled because we're discussing it. Oh. So, Ed, you brought it up. Well, I, I wasn't against okay. Sue going uh, to this meeting. All right, let me ask this. Is there any other I just want us to be aware of the about the balance of this budget item? Nobody else is. Okay. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, then. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Okay, we have uh, Carmen? Um, I'm not against item six, but I think I'd like to hear a bit of conversation about it, if that's possible. Should I state my concerns well uh, yeah I would recommend it if you have some inquiries into this you go ahead and pull it okay okay we'll do that all right let's consider that one pulled and is there a motion to approve the remainder of the consent calendar and that some? Includes the item that we were discussing about travel no it's I'm not it, Ed, no, Ed, didn't pull it. Pull. Ed didn't pull it okay. so moved Second. all in favor please raise your right hand say aye aye, aye. aye. Carmen Item number six. Okay. Item number six on its second page says that this study is not necessary to be complete before starting the emergency dredging of the stream. 
I, I re well, I'm combining some thoughts here. I've seen the big sign that is posted down by the stream which shows the work that's going to happen. And it appears that the dredging may be going only a very short distance east of the vehicular bridge, the one-way bridge. Um, this item six talks about widening the stream channel as well as dredging it between the dining hall and that bridge and evaluating whether that needs to happen further upstream and if so, how much further upstream. Um, the bridge itself is going to act as a throat there with all of its concrete mm -hmm. structure that would prevent widening that opening, I think. But my concern is that we have to have this done this season and we have to do it right. And I think it's, it's very important that these results be known in time to affect what's happening if they need to. So, so my problem is with that it's not necessary to be complete before the dredging starts. I think it's urgent that we know anything that it's going to determine in time to work it into the dredging if it needs to be, or the widening, or whatever that it comes up with. I found an end date, but I couldn't find a start date. So I, I didn't know if any action we took tonight could cause it to happen sooner than it would just otherwise fall into place. Well, um, we figure that this study will take about um, two, two months, possibly three months on the outside of getting information on the stream. But um, um, it, the um, dredge work is not predicated on this information. The dredge work uh, proposed for this summer is just to clear out that immediate area um, between the vehicular bridge and the dining hall so that we could get the water back into the channel. But uh, we have um, planned for next summer, which this information will be very valuable, um, is to how to address that channel section more thoroughly to get the water in the channel, keep it in the channel, and also to look for ways to improve sediment transport so it doesn't unload um, underneath the building. My concern is that is, is the capacity of the channel is, much of it is gone between that one-way bridge and the old wooden bridge that's east of the Sunholm Lodge. Mm -hmm. And that if we leave that full of gravel and then have bad floods next winter, can't it undo some of the good that we've tried to do this summer? Exactly. Well, a lot of it's um, um, as a result of some of the discussion that we've had with the Department of Fisheries, and um, uh, we looked at dredging uh, for limits further upstream, um, but um, uh, what we concluded that it's better to over dredge that lower section rather than dredge such a, a, a large amount out at this time. We do figure that with the winter storms that's coming, some of that will migrate back into this area. And um, um, we've, you know, we've, I think, pushed it just about as far as we can as far as how many yards that we can take out. Uh, we're looking at about 800 yards. I guess my, my biggest concern is that if the area alongside the dining hall, the area east of the one-way bridge, isn't dredged this summer, I wouldn't want us to put the money into redoing the dining hall and then finding out that that channel isn't adequate and we still get flooding at, at that part of the creek. Right. The whole intent is to, to look at dredging and widening that whole section out once again next summer. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Uh, when, when, is the, uh, when is the Moine Creek Basin, you know, general flooding project going to be done? When, when's the overflow pipe going to be available for use? Uh, well, we, uh, the committee um, uh, 
just got word that the uh, project uh, for the high flow bypass pipe uh, was awarded by the city of SeaTac um, uh, this week. So uh, with that, we'll give the notice to proceed to the contractor. That's so that's starting in June. Oh, that, that has something to do with the the um, the sewer district's pipe, right? Once we, yeah, we need to, two things to happen. We need the sewer district to finish their outfall. Yeah. When is that going to be? That's scheduled also for this fall. This fall. So those two projects in sync, if those things get completed this fall, then... The completion date is this fall. The start date for the sewer district project is this summer. So they're going to start, be starting it in July or August and they have it done by early fall. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, now, I'm, now I'm lost. Both projects. The sewer's putting in a new outflow. When they finish that, we get their old outflow right. for this project. So Correct. when is that going to occur? This fall. The, the, the projects will be done in the fall. Okay. Both projects will start in the summer. The connect like this summer. Correct. Oh. Correct. Okay. Now I understand. Thanks. Susan? <clears throat> when we still just, I want to make a motion then. Can I make a motion? Yes, you can. I move to award the contract for professional engineering services for the Lower Des Moines Creek Hydraulic Evaluation to Tetra Tech KCM Incorporated in the amount of $58,011 plus a 10% contingency and further to authorize the city manager to sign said contract. Second. Discussion, Scott. I'm glad that Carmen pulled this. I was going to try and let it go, but uh, this is the first I've heard of this project and or the study, and I'm the chair of the Environment Committee. And it would have seemed as though something like this might have come through the committee on its way to council. So I have a, a couple of questions. Either, since money isn't budgeted for this, either we didn't contemplate doing this when the budget was prepared, and it really shouldn't be a swim expenditure, it's associated with doing the buildings. So for the proposal to come in and say, well, let's have swim pay for half of it and the buildings pay for the other half, is, is another one of these things we come up with fairly early in the year that we didn't even plan or discuss during the budget process. I guess the other thing that's bothering me is that the council just recently considered an amendment to the Des Moines Creek Basin project, yet we're having to do our own work to figure out how to deal with the stream issues in Des Moines. Shouldn't this be a basin committee study if we're indeed dealing with the full flow of the basin? And shouldn't this expense be shared by all of the other parties if the water that's coming down the stream won't stay in it when it gets to our park? So, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed that the choices staff is making about where to get the money, I'm disappointed that we didn't ask the other agencies in the basin to contribute towards the study if it's needed, and Council conversations should have been had on those issues to make some recommendations. So based on that, I'm going to vote against it. Not that the information we get won't be valuable for doing things we need to do, but I think it's funded from the wrong place, and I don't think we tried to get the right people to pay for it. Scott, did you have a... Where in your mind would you say the funding should be coming from? Well, if it isn't part of, if we don't need it as part of the basin improvements, which we've been dealing as a three, four party agreement on, it shouldn't be funded out of stormwater. If we're doing it strictly for the beach park restoration project, to deal with how high to raise the buildings and some of that, it should be totally funded by the Beak Park Improvement Project. I'd like to hear some response from staff on that. 
And I'm not going to. You're not what? Carmen? Well, I don't know enough about this to know what the answer is, but part of this study is to document sediment sources. Uh, if they find that the sediment is purely the kinds of things that are there because of failure of the slopes that we had, that sort of makes it our problem. Whereas if they find that 90% of the gravel is from some foreign location and has swept down from things that the port did, then it seems to me that makes it an entirely different problem. Uh, but I don't honestly have any knowledge as to whether you can identify what you find in a stream that thoroughly to know whether it's a, a local source or an imported source. Ed? Since there are two questions that we, I interpret this as a question, uh, that we can't answer this evening. I'd, l I'd like to move that we defer action on this to our next meeting to allow the staff to do some research and provide, and provide some questions, answers. Yeah, um, there's, that's a separate motion. We'll have to take some action on this one. Well, no, that, no, that's, no that, the table. that's a motion to table. Oh, very good. Um, do I have a second? Okay. Is that a debatable motion? Or we, it's, is that, is that debatable? No. no. Okay. No. Motion to table? All right. Motion to table. All those in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, it's tabled, but I have to warn you, it's going to come back real quick. Well, I think well, it was the next, next meeting. meeting. The next mm -hmm. meeting. Is that part of your motion? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, the, the, the motion was made by Councilmember Penis, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Thomas. <sighs> to next to the next meeting. What is the point of tabling it? I uh, think oh, all right. Council Dan Member voted no and Sherman the rest of and White voted no. Let's get on with it. Okay. What I said. All right. Now, what's the point? I don't understand. All right. It's 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 a dead issue right now. Uh, it's been voted on, but it's table for. When is our next meeting? But the twenty-fourth. Two weeks. What are we going to accomplish? Uh, all right, yeah. Susan. It's it's not debatable right now. Um, Next meeting is May 24th, so we've got a couple of weeks. Okay, Council, um, we're going into a very big subject right now, one that I've been looking forward to for years. Uh, do you want to go ahead and take a break now so that we have it uninterrupted when we get back? Do I see some heads going yes? Sure. Okay. Sure. Let's go ahead and take 10 minutes and get into the main master plan. Let's. All right, let's continue our meeting. And the next item is uh, draft resolution 07 037, adoption of the Marina Master Plan. And as I stated before the break, Joe, I've been waiting for years on this. And even though we haven't made an agreement yet on whether or not we're going to adopt it this evening, I want to say something ahead of time. And that is, uh, I want to give all the kudos to the committee that's been handling this. It's uh, chaired by Councilmember Sherman, and the other members are. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Scott Thomason, and who's the and Carmen? The third one is Carmen. Uh, you've done a wonderful job. I have had been on this committee for many, many years, and have been frustrated by the committee for many, many years. And what I'm seeing here tonight, I think, represents a lot of hard work on your part. So that having been said, Joe. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sheckler. Uh, first, Council Member Sherman asked me to remind everyone that uh, Saturday is the South Sound opening day and uh, that we will be having our little event, which we call Safety on the Sound. It's open. It's we really target our our tenants and our customers, but it's we advertise it throughout the whole community and it's a it's a, uh, an event where people can come down and talk to different safety organizations and vendors who sell safety type equipment, uh, get their kids fitted for life jackets and things like that. We do have free hot dogs for people who come down. Uh, and it's a free event, so. Uh, well, there are boats out two. there with uh, colorful spinnakers uh, out there, of the sound. Depending on the weather, there may be. And the mayor what? will be there to present a proclamation, so. What uh, hours? Uh, Ten to two. Um, I believe the award ceremony is probably going to be around one o'clock-ish or so. One o'clock, yes. One o'clock. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, the last time we discussed the Marina Master Plan with the full Council was at the regular meeting on fe February 15th of this year. The major concern raised at that discussion was about the funding strategy for the proposed ca capital projects. 
At that time, the Council directed staff to work with the Municipal Facilities Committee to develop another funding plan. The staff and the committee have completed that task, and the Finance Director and I are here to, tonight to tell you about the results. In addition, we will also tell you about some minor changes to the draft document, mainly in the illustrations uh, that we, uh, we talked about on the 15th, and about uh, the committee's recommendations for some changes to the language in Chapter 5 regarding design guidelines. Uh, excuse me, design guidelines. Uh, to start, I'd like to give you some information about the materials included in the packet, uh, specifically Chapter 6 of the draft document. And when you got your packet, you might have noticed that I had put an extra paper clip on this because this portion, again, is is in a is will have to be reformatted, you know, and then possibly changed pending uh, the discussion tonight. But in this Chapter 6 packet, you'll see uh, there's a brief. Uh, discussion of the financial uh, uh, revenues and expenses and net profits of the marina. There's a map that shows the phasing for the, uh, the bulkhead projects and the projects. There's a list of the projects, including uh, a listed by phase, including uh, uh, cost estimates. And then the final portion of this uh, of this chapter six is titled financing plan, and this is the section that the finance director will be discussing with you in a few minutes. Yeah, and just as a clarification on this, um, Councilmember Kaplan had uh, had asked me about uh, page six three, where you have net profit. Yes. And he said, well, if you have so much money, what, what's the problem? Okay. And I told him, well, I believe that that really is uh, mm -hmm. funds that are being used to pay off the bonds mm -hmm. and for uh, capital projects now. But that doesn't seem to be made clear there. Uh, that's a good point. We should probably say net profit before debt service. So that And is that also before the capital projects that we're doing now as well, well that maybe we're using... Um, cash flow for? Uh, would it be before debt service and and transfer to back from operating to capital? So before those two items, yeah. Yeah, I think so, that clarification would be good. Yeah. Okay, because that it, the intention there is to show money that is available for capital, for, right? You know, essentially, to whether it's for debt service or. Transfer. But he thought that was after that fact, yeah. and I said, no, I don't think we have that much money coming it will, in. Uh, uh, we'll make that note, and we'll either have a little asterisk there or some explanation. Uh, next, I'd like to point out some of the changes to the draft document, mainly in the plan view of the marina floor. We spent some time on the 15th talking about this. Uh, one of the issues was the south, uh, the 227th Street entrance, and that is right in this area. Uh, the, do the plan view in the, the, the document we brought to the council on the 15th was actually incorrect. So we went back and showed where the, the landscaping islands are. We also showed the configuration of the South Marina Park as it, as it exists and as we plan. Uh, and again, there are no plans for that. We show some of the, uh, the sidewalk being widened in this area to create kind of a traffic uh, pedestrian corridor uh, down 227th to the bulkhead. Uh, the travel lift pier was another issue. It was a little out of scale, and it appeared to be uh, much larger than it actually will be. The, tra the travel lift, new travel lift pier is proposed for this area, and we also uh, were asked to show the, the what we think would be the likely travel lift pathway to the yard and to this storage area and show it to scale so we could see how much area that would take up. And then uh, included with your... Uh, the handouts I just gave you is a smaller drawing. It's labeled Figure 4-5, and if you remember, we talked about trying to make come up with a more detailed drawing of that area uh, north of the Marine Office that we're proposing for uh, uh, additional commercial space. So again, this is a concept. Uh, uh, in terms of the roof line, but in, in terms of the space that, that we would like to allocate for that activity, that's correct. Uh, traffic and, uh, again, would be a little, may change a little bit. Traffic and parking may change a little bit depending on the final orientation of a, of a, a possible building there. But this gives uh, hopefully a better idea of 
what could happen in that area. Changes to uh, Chapter 5 design guidelines. Uh, the staff and the committee discussed the design guidelines in, in Chapter 5 at the last committee meeting just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this, this was actually the first time we had a chance to discuss the design guidelines in Chapter 5. Um, it, but uh, after a lot of discussions, the committee recommended that the guidelines be left out of the draft, draft document because currently there are two efforts underway to create design guidelines for the downtown and the marina area. Uh, the first is a downtown design guidelines project that is actually an in-house project here uh, within the, uh, uh, the city's planning, building, and public works department. The second is the storefront studio project that is being conducted by the University of Washington Department of Urban Planning and Architecture. Because these projects are scheduled for completion in the near future, the committee is recommending that the guidelines in Chapter 5 be deleted from the draft, with the exception of the road and sidewalk cross sections and some of the uh, landscaping verbiage, uh, and that the new guidelines be developed after the two projects are completed to ensure that everything meshes together. Uh, the committee expects that the downtown projects will be completed and the new marina guidelines can be developed uh, easily within uh, a time frame to be useful to our projects, certainly before uh, next summer. Now, uh, take a minute and ask her any questions. We, we haven't discussed the projects again. We, I think we've, we've gone over those at, in quite some detail in past uh, discussions, but I can answer any questions you might have at this time, and then uh, we'll bring the finance director up to talk about the financing. Council, why don't you go ahead and bring her up. Okay. Uh, Need to get to PowerPoint. What do we have up here? <laughs> Oops. Just close that out. And yep. Open up PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. When we last presented, uh, we were using an annual increase of five percent for the revenue growth, and we reduced that to three point five percent after two thousand nine and uh, pretty much everything else stayed the same. Uh, the growth in the general fund transfer, I have at 2%, and that um, basically uh, takes off from what we have in the budget of 450000 for 2007, so it's going to escalate at 2%. Um, this graph is, is in the master plan. Um, basically, it shows the spread between the, the revenues and the uh, expenses. And there are some capital contributions in there, but it is before debt service. Um, what I show is a, a series of capital contributions. And then we have like restricted cash as well that is building up. And I was able to pull some other capital contributions out of that. <coughs> so what we're going to need uh, pretty much is about $29.9 in resources. 20, 21.9 oh, 21 million. Let's not add, add $8 million, we don't. No. Um, there's a series of three bond issues. Uh, that will total approximately 14.5 million. The first uh, three phases will be about 12 million uh, in debt, and the fourth phase is 2.5 million. Um, the other resources that I'm looking at using are we have from the 2002 issue unspent bond proceeds of 1.5 million. And then the marina capital contributions of 3.9 million. And then we've identified other capital contributions or grants, and initially we identified those as city invested um, contributions of approximately 1.6 million. Uh, Joe went through um, the capital improvements and identified the sidewalks and landscaping and the public restroom amenities that we could consider that the city would contribute to. And then we have interest earnings on unspent bond proceeds that are accumulating um, as the projects proceed. So this table provides a summary of basically the resources that I just discussed. And uh, 
basically when you have the, the debt, um, you do have to pay the cost of issuance and also the requirement for a debt reserve that must be set aside. In the first issue for 2007, um, I'm pretty much using um, cash, and I'm only using 100000 from the bond proceeds to fund that debt service. We have sufficient cash to cover the rest of that um, debt reserve requirement. And the rest of the other two issues I will have to um, borrow to get the debt reserve. So um, this one uh, graph is really cash from operations before debt service. I'm not using the term profit. Um, the reason being is I have not included depreciation in my assumptions because it's non-cash. I really wanted to see what cash is available. Um, we look pretty tight 2012 through 2014. Um, we really just are just making it. But what is in um, uh, basically the restricted cash is we've set aside uh, 45 days of um, uh, operating reserves, which represents 12% of the uh, expenses. And um, Dave's not here, but normally he asks, and for your information, where is our annual citywide debt service going to be with these series of three bond issues? And we're approaching 1.7 million in 2016. And uh, this shows our restricted, our unrestricted, and our annual net cash. As you can see, the restricted cash is building up, and that's because of the, um, the debt serve requirement and the uh, operating reserves. So we still have significant cash. It's just set aside. Is this um, marina cash only, or is this citywide? No, this is marina cash only. Because you showed that previous slide that was right. debt. And uh, not included in this cash, I've left the repair and replacement fund alone. So that fund is just standing alone, and it's not in any of these um, calculations for beginning cash or anything. But um, let's see if I missed any other comments I wanted to make. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Thomason mentioned that we can restructure a debt service. What I've done in our issues here is I've just used 20-year bonds with principal payments, and it's modeled after uh, the 2002 debt issue. Uh, another alternative is what you can do is structure the debt where you just pay interest only, let's say, for the first five years of the uh, bond issue. And then, obviously, after the fifth year, your principal payments are going to be significantly higher. Um, I just took an example for the 2011 um, bond issue, and what it looks like is we'd pay an additional 500000 in interest over the life of the bond, but we would be you know, uh, basically uh, reducing that first five years of that bond issue by about approximately 200000 which would make our cash um, availability a little bit better. So there are different ways to structure. So if there's anything else. And uh, the final graph I show is uh, just our availability. Can you hold on a second? There's a yes. question on. Okay, so in your estimation then, um, I mean, it sounds like those home loans that people pay interest on, all of a sudden, you know, so what, what it's we, not the subprime market, no. It's <laughs> like, I'm thinking, oh, my God. What are we, so what, what would be your feeling on this, though? I mean, what, you, what would you recommend? Or what do you think makes the most sense? Well, uh, right now I feel very comfortable with the first bond issue to see the amount that we're um, um, projecting out. It's when we get down to 2011, we have to look at the um, – Basically, the timeline of the projects and how many, um, well, the quantity, whether we've spent all our bond proceeds or do we have unspent bond proceeds. We could delay the bond issue another year or we restructure it 
um, the way I just mentioned, if our cast availability doesn't allow us to have sufficient cushion. And, and part of that decision will also be driven by, our, um, <clears throat> by the company that we use to issue the debt and what they're comfortable with <clears throat> based upon what our financials actually look like when the debt is issued. If they don't like our reserves or the, um, what's the term you're using up there? Uh, which, unrestricted cash? Uh, if that's not high enough, if those lines are getting too close, they may insist that we put out an issue that allows us to build up more cash at the beginning at the expense of paying more interest out at the end. That is true. And also we meet uh, the 1.25 um, bond covenants for the coverage ratio, even in the scenario that I presented. So we're meeting that. Okay, so initially we'd be going out for the first... You know, the first issue this first year, year, yeah, right. approximately 5.8 million. I've got 5.7. Okay, so we'd you know, be doing that when, like, this year? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then when would we go after the next one? Then? Oh. Uh, in the plan, it's 2011. We would need more money. And it's if likely it, that the first bond issue will just be a straight one like the current one. Mm -hmm. It's in 2011, depending on our cash situation, where we might end up doing that or something a little bit more okay. fancy. Or we get more contributions. Right. Um, Correct. Um, yes. But still, with that debt coming off, you still are tight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. One, I just want to make sure that it's brought to the council members' attention that uh, the, the portion that was mentioned about the cities making capital contributions of a certain amount for amenities in the marina that are considered for the general public, that's a new policy issue that uh, that's in there. And the other thing, question I've got is, um, you know, all the total of projects – if we include the guest merge as well as 32 million, we're covering 22 million. If you take the guest merge part out, that's you know seven million there. So there's like about three or four million dollars for for phases uh, five, six, seven, eight. You know some other bulkhead replacements and so forth. So I mean, this looks like you're taking it out till about 2015. Um, for phases one through four, but then we've got we have other things we need to do. Right, I, we took it out to 2017. Yeah. 17. And I think um, our reasoning on that is that after that, it, it just gets so fuzzy that it's it's really hard to predict. I mean, to come up with a a, a plan that that uh, is going to make sense anyway. Beyond 10 years. Yeah. So uh, we just took the first, uh, I believe, the first four phases. We know that that's uh, what we can realistically get done, you know, in, in the next five years or five or six years. So after that, we'll, and and again, we'll be constantly. This will be a plan that has to be constantly reevaluated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, really, the 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 bull in the china closet here is the the bulkhead. That's the thing that's so expensive and has so many unknowns. So once we get past the first project the first section of bulkhead then I think a lot of our questions will be answered you know and, and then we'll and, and we'll have a much better idea of what the rest of it's going to cost well, can't we also ask for funding from you know yes funding? yes we will we'll be asking uh, uh, a city manager m may have some comments on that because he's had some discussions with our state representatives and we and there's uh, uh, federal money available and state money although for <clears throat> this type of project where we uh, we aren't uh, if we take that expanded guest mortgage component out of it, uh, a lot of the funds that are out there, like federal funds, uh, voting infrastructure grants, therefore the creation of new uh, mortgage guest mortgage essentially uh, greater than 26 feet, uh, voting facility program money, uh, that's money at the state level, is essentially there for again guest mortgage type things, boat launching type things. For just mortgage where it's uh, where it's uh, uh, month to month mortgage, there aren't as much, there, it's not as available for that type of use. But I will say we will be talking with our state and federal delegation about pure and simple uh, 
What am I trying to say? Uh, direct allocations, direct yeah. appropriations, thank you, uh, of money in, in, in the state and federal budgets. And uh, Senator Kaiser caught me on, on Monday during the event that we were at with the governor, and she said, sometime this summer we all need to sit down, you need to show us what you're doing, what your timing is, and we can start talking about what we can do. Mm -hmm. So the, the portion that's left for the end, the guest mortgage, is one where we're most likely to be able to get some grants. Pop yes, yes, exactly. Uh, the other stuff... One, we would certainly need to sit down and have that conversation with our representatives and our senator and see what's available. Well, we didn't work any of that into this uh, proposal because it's not a sure thing uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So we're counting on funding it all ourselves. And if anything else comes in to help us, it's uh, the frosting on top. I was there when Senator Kaiser was making that comment. And so I would trust that uh, later on this year that you and maybe – one or two committee members would be involved in those discussions. Scott? Clearly, uh, anything the legislators can do to keep the Department of Natural Resources from la raising the lease rates would <laughs> make, well, that's a good, make, make a big difference. Absolutely. Um, speaking of the financing plan, which I would say is on page... Well, can I interrupt you for a second, Scott? Yeah. I want to make sure that uh, Councilmember White got all of her answers. Are you... Okay. Go ahead. Um, this page isn't numbered, but it's the one that has the chart, table 6X, all the, all the tables may be X. Um, you know, the committee discussed how do we make ends meet, and there was conversation of, well, subsidize the marina by reducing the interfund transfer. Um, what the committee said, or at least what I'd said as a suggestion, is for projects that clearly have a general public benefit that are beyond the scope of what the marina might have, um, CIP money in the form of REIT money or other things could be used and could be eligible. So as was mentioned, there's a fair amount of that money programmed in here, and at least on a first blush, a higher amount than I might have anticipated. Um, Although, as was said, Joe got his calculator out. And, Those and fancy sidewalks are expensive. Uh, and I'm sure he put everything on his calculator and moved it all out of the marina. So so these are probably... And the finance director moved some of it back in. Yeah, well, so so I'm not... So so I guess the, the, the tension is I'm okay with this in terms of a concept plan because this isn't the budget and when we get down to selling bonds and doing the CIP. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I would imagine is as the CIP comes forward in this fall's budget, which will show six years worth of expenditures, mm -hmm. this, uh, the 2008 and 2011 numbers, the marina will now be competing with other things with the beach park. And we'll have to make choices about what, where we spend that money, and so even though this suggests five hundred fifty-five thousand and eight and three hundred and seventy thousand in year eleven, uh, you may or may not get that allocated, and then we'll have to read you the plan. I just don't want this to be read as the commitment that this money has now been allocated to the marina without those further discussions. So um, if that is the understanding, I'm okay with approving it. If for some reason there's an expectation that this allocates that money, we need to have more conversation. So I guess uh, in is, is my understanding everyone's understanding? That, that was certainly my understanding. I think speaking for <laughs> for staff side. We'll see. <laughs> okay, Scott, you want to put your, underst your understanding in the form in the form of a well of a modification maybe motion. Not. Um, I, it could be that a sentence or two should be added under the table to make that yeah. clear. But I think that. Yeah, intent makes sense that you know this is a an approach 
with the exact numbers to be figured out as we move forward. Yeah. So you'd like some language in the in the master plan document itself? Well, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Just a footnote to the table that this is an estimate of the amount, and right. we'll come up later. I think would suffice. Yeah, yeah. something that depending on That's you CIP. might talk us into more. Yeah, well, and, it, and like you said, it will <laughs> depend on the annual CIP process. So right, and, and it depends on which sidewalk is right at what time. Yeah, right. And so. Who knows what emergency we'll have by then? So, you know, so. Susan. Okay, I'm going to make a motion. Um, I move that the city council adopt, adopt draft resolution 07037, adopting the updated marine and master plan for the Des Moines I'll second that. Go ahead, Dan. You deserve to second it. Put it down as Dan. Okay. Discussion, Scott. I have a question on section two of the ordinance, and it's just. Section 1 adopts, I assume, the book that's in our packet, although it lists places, blanks to fill in for pages of, and the appendices. Section 2 suggests that the original Marina Master Plan is attached as an, an, an appendix, but when I see the list of appendices, I don't see that plan listed. So I'm, I'm confused. Does this replace that plan? Does this supplement the old plan? I think it's complete enough. In my opinion, it's complete enough to s actually replace that plan. It was our intention to include the plan yeah, in the appendices, but our and that's probably maybe a discussion that we need to have with the committee or the full council when we actually create the final document. We have several large documents to go in the appendices and maybe for the purposes of distribu distribution to the council we don't they, the council might not need all that information so we may want to talk uh, about the actual final form of that and what we want to include in the well the appendices. only problem is section one and section two describe what the final form is okay <laughs> so we need to sure. know what that is in order to finish filling out its section um, in my, in my, again, in my opinion, that's our, that's discretionary. If we, if the council feels uh, uh, that that information should be included in the final document as an appendices, if, if for nothing else, historical, uh, uh, for historical purposes, uh, it's fine. We can easily do that. If you'd like to delete it, we can do that also. Well, let's include. I don't think it would need to be included. It's still a document of record under the old mm -hmm. resolution. Yes. Let's change the wording now. Yeah. So I would amend to delete section two. Yeah, that's. I, I would move to amend that section two be deleted. From I agree. The I'll second that. Council, did I hear? Did you make a motion, Scott? You made a motion. I made a motion. Did someone I second it? I believe so. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 It is now deleted. Okay. Scott, anything else? And then I'm just assuming that from what you just said, that there are three appendices, which is our, uh, listed on this appendix yes. list, which are part of the document, and you will fill in however many pages that yes. adds up to. Exactly. Okay. I'm good then. Council, further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, draft this is draft resolution number 07 037, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Des Moines, Washington, adopting the updated Marina Master Plan for the Des Moines Marina as amended. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. And I would just like to add that um, our committee is not finished with, with working on this. Uh, because uh, within this plan, there are elements that, that need to be completed, such as uh, the new restaurant, new right. marine hardware. Right. And uh, next week, the committee is actually ha uh, meeting with some interested parties uh, regarding the, um, the restaurant portion, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to move that portion along. Uh, which also includes coming up with the final specific configuration in that area so we can start doing the bulkhead replacement. That's going to be exciting, too, what that finally looks like down there. All right. Great job again. As I stated earlier, I, I 
I mean, totally impressed with what the committee has done, and particularly how quickly we got it through today's meeting. I don't think in 12 years I've seen this occur. Next item is uh, draft resolution, oh, excuse me, continued review of the Des Moines Creek uh, Business Park draft second development agreement. And Grant, are you uh, going to be the presenter on this? Uh, yes, sir, I am. All right. It's it's updated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, April's been filled in. Our well, schedule. we'll always give you as part of our our discussions kind of the current schedule and the, the date of the current schedule. You can see here. down on the lower right hand uh, corner of the footer. Uh, this is the. Uh, and this simply reflects the decisions that council made uh, last week. Uh, and uh, and where we are again, the uh, the dark green box are completed actions, and the open right. white boxes with the little circle dates on the top bar dates work. We have uh, penciled in council uh, council consideration of the various issues. Tonight uh, we we come to council to continue our discussion from last uh, the last meeting where we. Uh, we're looking for council direction on a series of policy questions. And tonight we, we framed those questions a little more clearly. Uh, we tried to do that in your council package as well. There are 13 policy questions. And the policy questions are designed to help us, help you, the council, achieve the uh, intent of the Des Moines Municipal Code in general and DMMC 1825 in particular. So we're really looking for this direction to us so that we can continue to work and bring you uh, s staff work which which uh, move which uh, advances the policy uh, direction that you you provide us again the purpose uh, of our work here is to um, develop the uh, the uh, Des Moines Creek Business Park um, and as we mentioned uh, receive the policy direction that will further uh, the development of the park and the second development agreement. Oh, the outcomes which we, uh, by way of review, which we covered with council, uh, and these four bullet points, a vibrant employment center, we'll, we'll, tell, we'll talk more specifically with you here in a few minutes about what exactly that means. But in general, it means generating jobs and economic activity and socioeconomic benefits that you've agreed with us in earlier discussions we want to achieve for the city. Um, it also includes a new source of both one-time and, and ongoing, both direct and indirect economic benefits, and for the port, increased trade opportunities, and for all of us, a, an attractive and safe community asset. This chart is intended to uh, kind of summarize in a very conceptual way what is envisioned in the first development agreement. Uh, there was a first development agreement. It uh, anticipated the uh, council approval of a, a second development agreement, which would approve a, the conceptual master plan. Um, it would then in turn lead to some st street uh, vacation and would conclude with the uh, cons council consideration of more of a more detailed master plan uh, developed under the requirements of uh, 1825. The process which we are offering, uh, a revision in this process which we're offering for the council's consideration is a bit different. Uh, first, we start with a set of uh, success indicators 
uh, they're the ultimate outcomes that we, that you have agreed uh, with us in earlier discussions we're looking to achieve uh, on this project. And we've, we've talked about those here just a few slides ago. Uh, the work uh, that, that resulted from the first development agreement was substantially more detailed than I think anyone uh, really understood. And Denise, um, we have, if you can just hand me those, Denise, those, those. Yeah, those, all those. This work here uh, is the conceptual uh, master plan. I don't, I'm not sure that anybody realized when they approved the first development agreement that the conceptual master plan would have this much detail associated with it. Oh, sure we did. Um, there is the plan itself no, you... and then uh, documents which, which are even larger that are the, uh, the environmental analysis of that plan. So there's a substantial amount of work here, uh, uh, and many of us believe that this work is the uh, same level of detail that would tip, you would typically see with work supporting a, uh, a PUD or subdivision application. And so we're, we want to build on this work uh, as, we, as we move forward. And so because of all the additional work that went into the, cons the development of this material, we believe we can bring to the council uh, a development agreement, second development agreement, with s some supporting work in, in the form of a resolution, very similar in form to the one that you are used to and that you most recently dealt with in Blueberry Lane, and an outline of which is attached to your council package as a, attachment one, a resolution that sets out the conditions of approval of, of this project. And it's our proposal to continue to work with council in, re in receiving from you your direction as to what those conditions of approval should be and for, the, for us then to work to d deliver you a product which aligns with your direction on, on conditions of approval and the development requirements uh, for this project working not just with you but with the, the, the private marketplace to make sure that the product which, which, you, which we offer for your consideration is in fact a project which aligns with the interests, the commercial interests of the marketplace uh, in terms of its, um, its um, how entitled the, the property is the conditions under which, uh, the, in, in other words, the development box that we uh, offer the, the marketplace to, to develop within, uh, the environmental si uh, sideboards and, and criteria, we believe all of those things will be will be absolutely critical to move this project forward in a way which uh, meet, best meets the interests of the community, best meets the ec interests of the port, and best meets the uh, requirements of the marketplace. So that's the, kind of in a general way the, the differences between the first development agreement process and the pr process which we're proposing here. And we're, we'll be handing out this slide which is basically a summary of these, the previous slide and this slide just as a, as a point of reference as we continue this discussion. What we have next are 13 policy questions. And we'd like to kind of work through these questions one at a time. Um, and they bring us from the from a high level down to a more specific level. And each of these policy questions are intended to help us, help you achieve these objectives which are laid out on the right margin there. With this is always awkward because at some point we will be dealing with some issues on a quasi-judicial basis. Other issues are legislative. Has the final environmental impact statement run its course? It has. So it's so 
are we as a council now free to talk about it and question and, and because before we didn't we were silent and because an appeal would have been a quasi judicial issue correct I, I guess what troubles me in all of this is the zoning code is clear that a master plan application needs to come in with any subdivision application and the two shall be processed simultaneously and as you go through that subdivision process and the master plan process is when you're really evaluating the proposal and the impacts of the proposal and so for the development agreement to have a list of these are the impacts you have to address before we've had the information and gone through the hearing process to evaluate what is being proposed and the impacts and the mitigations that need to come out of it leaves me uncomfortable unless you actually have that full level discussion and take the environmental impact statement apart so that we understand it so that the right mitigations are listed in the agreement we I'm sorry I didn't mean to so so I I struggle with doing the development agreement on a conceptual master plan with specific mitigations that implies there's no second bite at the apple when we actually do the full plat and subdivision work where you're analyzing the full level of the impacts. You know, they're trying to get certainty out of the development agreement when certainly at a council level we're still trying to discern what the impacts are staff seen it a lot more so you have a better understanding but you know we were just talking about the 24th 28th local improvement district so I can only imagine that staff is going to say well we're not going to make the developer build the street the street will show up later somehow but there's no guarantee of that but when we get to the subdivision there's going to need to be a guarantee of that so I understand trying to go to a developer and have them understand the framework upon which they could make a proposal but it seems like we're trying to get rid of all of the risk for them and there ends up being huge risk on the city well those are those are all valid uh, concerns at this point and what we want to do is understand the concerns like that the council has so we can uh, continue to work on uh, so the port can continue to work on its development application and we can continue to think about what the conditions of approval of that application would look like and we believe that the work done in the conceptual master plan the environmental impact statement uh, will provide um, an adequate uh, basis for the council to set out its development requirements and its conditions of approval of work that would occur on the site it's not at all clear and we we really won't know until a developer is selected whether this thing's going to be subdivided in a way that would even have to come to council as a subdivision well I would imagine UD. that in order to lease land as I understand it you either have to create lots through a subdivision or a binding site plan and both of those have to come through council as quasi-judicial land development hearings so it's going to be here and I must admit some of the policy questions implied well staff had certain discretion but that troubled me because I know it runs right into subdivisions or binding site plan applications where council is the final authority and it would be awkward if staff would have agreed to something that is the council's final say is its quasi-judicial process yeah you want to chime in on this <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Mayor, I, I simply haven't had op an opportunity to review either of the development agre agreements, the first one or the proposed second agreement. And, and, and my understanding is the former city attorney is doing that on behalf of the city. I spoke with her briefly this evening about it, but I'm certainly not in a position to render an opinion. But you're aware of the concern? Yes. He, uh, uh, Council Member Thomason expressed that concern to me prior to the meeting. Oh, all right. Uh, Bob, yes, you know, we're, we're sitting here with the council worried about and, do, and properly worried about not giving away its authority and requirement to take to, to review certain actions. We're also sitting here with a development and a staff trying to create from a plot a vision of something that will be economically viable for, for both parties. And I think what I've looked upon this, the previous sessions and this session, as the staff saying, what kinds of things would you consider reasonable? Would you consider unreasonable? Uh, and, and maybe what they did for the develop is, 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 is another, uh, a, I don't know if I want to call it a master plan, but a, a, another document between the, the, the city and, and the port that basically defines reasonable things and how to, but when they still get to the point of actually wanting to do a development, have to prepare a development plan in the normal process to, to come to the council. Well, thank you, Ed, because I, I don't really understand at this point what is considered reasonable either on either party's part. Right. And, and what they're asking is, let's discuss what's reasonable. <laughs> Your Honor. Let me suggest that we allow Grant to, to get through, <clears throat> excuse me, a fair part of the, the presentation. I think it will help bring it together a little bit better. And I'm also going to suggest that where we're with the policy questions, we frame them, we provide detail what it is we're looking for, but we don't ask council to try to answer any of them until we get all the way through them. And then we can go back to the beginning and start asking council to try to answer some of the questions. That seemed like a reasonable way to go. Rob, mm -hmm. perhaps could provide a little context here uh, to kind of set the stage for this. Uh, yeah, for just this jump session. in. All right. I, well, I just wanted to make one final statement to make sure I understand what Scott's concerns were and that we're all on the same page with this or so that others understand what the concerns that the council might have, or some of the, some of the council members. And I think what I heard you saying, Scott, was, you know, we're going through this process. In the end, we're going to wind up seeing some uh, more refined project that's going to be the final project that we have to approve. And yet we may be doing things along the line here where when we see it, we think certain conditions should be applied and yet based on our earlier decisions without having seen that project uh, someone may say to us well sorry you already made a determination on that you have no further say and is that what you're worried about yeah the zoning code when we wrote it a decade ago created a specific process to be able to build and it created this master plan process that was to take place commensurate with whatever subdivision review was going on. And we did that once for mm -hmm. CTI, yes. whatever that was called. CCI. 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 Was, uh, right. was cell Therapeutics, CTI, yes. Yeah. So, CTI. and the port did that as their own developer at the time. So the port staff came up with this plan. They had a tenant, they had a lease. And it's my impression that the port doesn't want to do that. They don't want to be the developer per se. They now mm -hmm. want to find a development company. Yeah. But the port wants to put enough shape in a box so that the, that developer can move forward mm -hmm. with certainty. But they don't want to be specific enough because they want that developer to come up with a specific plan. But yet we're being asked to create the certainty for them by saying this is all you have to do when we haven't reviewed it to the mm -hmm. level that the zoning code prescribed should be reviewed. Right. And there's the tension. 
There's the tension. There's the tension right there in terms of what works for everybody. I mean, I know that um, just real quickly so we can get down to business here, that there are times when we've been brought along. I mean, I've been on the council long enough that there are times we've been brought along and said, well, no, well, you're not really making the final decision now, so just, just follow us along with this little bit. And they take you along little bit by bit by bit, and before you know it, you've gotten somewhere where you never wanted to be. Um, so that, I think, is the, the concern. That's all. Okay. And, and I'll say I have no problem staying until 11 tonight to do this thing just okay. so that we don't run out of time. So, so uh, Rob Larson with ClearPath, the City of Des Moines Real Estate Advisor, uh, commenting just generally on the approach being taken here, and that is that the approach being taken here is unusual in a sense. Not every development is following this path, but the more significant developments around the area and the more significant ones uh, that are, have been successful are following a path more like this. The Boeing uh, Renton development is an example where a lot of work was done up front, a lot of planning, uh, road infrastructure planning and so on to uh, create a predictable and efficient process that ultimately allowed developers to come in quickly, quantify their risk quickly, and move forward. And you see the benefits of that to the city um, and to the development community and the region as a whole. Here, um, the port uh, really has taken the initiative to hire a small army of consultants, professionals, to put their collective best thinking into uh, this project, uh, the land uses that could be attracted here in light of the city's regulatory structure. And so they've created these documents that Grant um, presented to you. Uh, there's a lot of detail about these two alternative schemes that uh, very bright thinkers think are, are the ways that this site could be developed. And then the environmental impact study followed those schemes. And so um, Unlike a typical land sale where you have no idea really how it would be developed until it's sold and the developer comes in and follows your typical regulatory process, here a lot of thought has been put in. And so what we are asking you is to consider the definition provided by the conceptual master plan as kind of the bracket of uh, future activities that might take place and say that developer, if you come in and you address uh, these and you uh, come forward with a, a development that's along these lines, then here's kind of what you deal with. If you're outside this box, here's how we're going to take a look at it. So that creates predictability. It allows you an opportunity to take a closer look if they're not right in the channel somehow. Mm -hmm. So that that's what we're asking uh, this evening is, you know, will you allow us to move forward down this broad channel, really, with with much more opportunity in the future for you to define decision criteria and, def and create the definition. Well, I think that, at least for me, that clarified some of this muddle that I think we're all kind of looking at. Because, you know, if we start going through each one of these things, I mean, it's like we are not the experts that have put in all this amount of time in this that are coming up with these conceptual ideas that I know I think are going to be beneficial for everybody. So, you know. Get cracking. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Uh, so so the first, uh, the first uh, question is basically a kind of a reaffirmation of what we talked with you about when we brought the charter information forward and we've covered with you uh, a couple times earlier. The second uh, is a is a question that basically uh, asks you to allow us to bring you information in the form of a resolution with development requirements and conditions of approval uh, that would basically set out uh, and establish these approval criteria. The third uh, question is around the notion of, of, of uses and a flexible approach to those uses to create this uh, this thing we call a vibrant employment center. We've provided a definition here. That was a, a, a source of confusion last time. And basically, we're, we're, we're talking about jobs, economic uh, activity, uh, uh, direct and indirect uh, revenues, 
uh, along the lines of what has been estimated for this site, which are substantial. The next question has to do with uh, the way in which we deal with uh, building locations, heights, and sizes. And we're basically asking you the question, and, and the way in which we achieve uh, the, re the direction that you provide us here, uh, we'll, we can figure that out. And whether, as, as Mayor Pro Tem Thomason suggested last time, maybe uh, the, the right path to achieve these results is through a, uh, a, 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 an amendment to the zoning code, as opposed to a development agreement approach, which kind of trumps the zoning code. So the way in which we achieve these results, uh, we, we would like the license to kind of bring you options on the way that we believe best does it, if you agree with, uh, with the answer to this, or provide us the answer to this question. The next question has to do with the way we deal with parking and loading configurations and ratios. The next question has to do with the, question, with the issue of parks and recreation areas and requirements. The next question has to do with how, we fa how development is phased on the site, recognizing it's a very large site and it's unlikely that it will be developed kind of in one, uh, in one uh, phase. And the final set of questions have to do, and these are, this is just a, a starting point in the discussion about what, what we establish as vesting rights under this agreement uh, for land use approvals, not, not building permits. Uh, those are governed by the codes in effect when complete application is received, but rather for land use approvals. And if, if the council chooses to provide an extended vesting period, then what are the conditions there? I mean, you can't just kind of give, uh, extend these, uh, these benefits and, and then not expect that there would be some good faith efforts on the part of the developer, the port, to move this project along in an expeditious way. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. And then, and then uh, the term of the agreement, and, and again, this is very open for, for council, council direction. Uh, and then we turn to the question of the, the kind of the approach that would be used and, and whether the council feels comfortable in, in uh, an approach which, uh, which basically creates the regulatory standards and conditions of approval, the development box, if you will, uh, kind of allowing staff then to make sure that the project conforms to the direction that the council has established. And then that's the second part of that uh, of that question on the site plan detail. And then the final is the kind of the open-ended question: Are there is there anything else as, that 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 comes to mind that you would like at this time to provide us direction on, so we can go back to work as staff, working with our colleagues at the port, and bring you uh, a more completed uh, staff proposals. Okay, and, you know, as a, it's it's very broad, but on the face of it, everything I just saw up there, I'm not having heartburners struggling with. But if there's someone on the council here tonight, that is you're having a hard time doing what? You're struggling with. I'm not. I'm saying I'm not having a hard time. But this, oh, the overall, the questions that we're being asked here. None of this has given me any heartburn. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. So the staff want us to go back and look at each and every one of these and give you an answer? Uh, That's what you're asking the council to do tonight? We'd like to have a conversation with the council uh, on these questions, starting with the first one. And then and let's work, go ahead and take through. them one by one mm -hmm. and do exactly that. Is that what you're handing out here? This is a copy. Of the this is a copy of the slide. All right. And, and Denise reminds me that that 
our design of the process from this point forward. We, we can design uh, working sessions with council on any of these, a single subject item or, or groups of topics, and we can work set out those working sessions in study session format or in, uh, in, council, uh, in council discussion, whatever form uh, is most comfortable well, and helpful to the council. What's the time frame we want to, you know, move this? I mean, I can imagine we can spend hours and hours on this. That's what I'm thinking. Well, the, the, the first question is, do we st is the council still in support of this, this general direction that yes. we've talked about now several times? Yes, Scott. I, I sort of agree with it. But as I said last time, I liked the words that were on this chart better that you had, which on the integration of the site, the second one mentioned environment, infrastructure, and aesthetics. Um, that one doesn't say that. And to me, the infrastructure and the environmental impacts are a key component. What, what troubles me about what this implies, though, is that we change the back end process. So to say that we're going to have a front end process, it implies that we're saying the back end process is going to be changed. And the zoning code and the subdivision code is very clear about what the back end process is. So until we figure out what the back end is, you know, this one leads you astray, uh, what, or it what, may lead you astray. As, as we tried to illustrate on this chart, what, what did not exist when the code was done a decade ago uh, was what it is we're trying to achieve through this development, uh, through the 1825 process. And we're, we're suggesting that the council consider that we focus on what it is that we're trying to achieve. What's the ultimate outcome associated with this development? Is it to to kind of conform to a to a process as, as laid out in 1825, which is a process goal, or is it kind of an outcome goal that deals with employment, development uh, standards, uh, or are they, in the council's mind, kind of one and the same? So. Well, the way the zoning code was written, and I don't I don't remember if Carmen you were on at the time, was you know, there was a process that said, when you bring it forward, we're going to approve a master plan that lays out how it will be built. And it was sort of the, we'll know we like it when we see it. And if we like it when we see it, we'll let you go forward. But it wasn't it wasn't a rezone and come in and do whatever you wanted. It was, this is a rezone with a specific process to get an end result. And at that time, we were being shown developments in SeaTac on the north on 24th, 28th, with tall buildings and basically an urban center and this the expectation was this was just the south end of that urban center and you know what we're now being asked to approve is perhaps something less than an urban center or at least a piece of an urban center but but something on its own and instead of showing us and we know we like it when we see it we're being said trust us you know um, Oh, if if we want to take out the council review process, change the zoning code and change the process. Mm -hmm. oh. and, yeah. and and I guess that's the question the council should be having mm -hmm. is when that code was written, it was written specific that it was up to the, the council held closely the discretion on what got approved. If this council doesn't care, and I'm not saying I don't care, but I, I'm, for one, was in support of what we adopted. If this council doesn't care, change the code, take that council approval process out, and let them do what they want and trust staff. If the council still strongly cares with what gets built there, then we should keep it and follow the process. Okay, let's just go straight on down. Yes, yeah, so we are changing the process. We're doing a different process than than is in the code. We were asked to, we agreed to it, and we started with that first part of the development agreement. So we are doing something different. You're entirely correct. Um, the I guess what I see is 
Yeah, I like to look at, at a project as it's going to be, uh, you know, as the developer's proposing it, and then, you know, then I, then I may truly understand them. It's like, it's like trying to figure out, all right, for me, it would be trying to figure out what a suit's going to look like from a little swatch of cloth, and I have trouble doing that. Um, I need to actually see the suit <laughs> with that material. Um, and that's, I think, what you're, and, and so, and I, I do find it easier to figure out what kind of mitigation or limitations or whatever once I know exactly what's going to be done. But I also understand in this case that it's a large piece of property and we don't know exactly what's going to be done. I mean, even the port doesn't know yet. No one really knows exactly. We're still in the process of getting there. In the end, I think we will be looking at the project and, and making a, some kind of a final approval, but we won't even at that time know every structure that's going to be in there because it's going to be phased, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, that all of the uh, businesses that are going to occupy this, this property are not going to be known up front. I mean, there's got to be somebody to get it started, but they're not all going to be known. Um, so we're asked to, you know, and then we're being asked, well, we're talking about this kind of a mix. Is that kind of a mix all right with you? Um, and we've been discussing that, what kinds of things. And yes, if we go outside the channel, the channel is the mix that we've approved. We go outside that channel, maybe there's some additional restrictions we'll need to place or look at. But I do see this as a give and take process. And yes, there's a certain amount of trust involved, you know, the trust but verify thing, we still have some control. I'm just worried when we get to the end, will we, will we have, you know, given all of the approvals and won't be able to do any final decision making, but I can understand that a developer with such a large project isn't going to want to come in um, if every, every time they have to put a new building in, yeah. they have to come back to us. So I understand that. And I'm willing to make a change in the way we do things a little bit. Um, it's a big piece of property, and the, and the things I definitely don't want to happen are a degradation of the environment in general with the, the creek, and um, I don't want it to be impossible for me to get into town on 216th and not be able to get to the post office because the traffic is so bad, so I want that to be considered. Um, and I don't want it to, to be a blight when you're looking at it, the aesthetic part from the outside. I mean, if you're not, if you're looking at it from the outside, if you're inside, I mean, maybe I don't care that much. But, uh, you know, from the ordinary resident, I want that to look. And I think, we're, I think we're thinking of these things. I think the staff has helped us. I think that the ports uh, um, consultants have, are considering these things as well. Our consultant is considering them. and. So I'm sort of okay with the process. I mean, again, like I said, I'm hoping that when it's all over, I don't say, oh, my God, I, I didn't think of this, and now, I, now they're telling me I can't. But I think <clears throat> we're thinking of the big picture, the things that we really care about. Um, so I'm not that worried that we're, we're not thinking of, of those things. Yeah. I don't think we're ever going to get past this one particular thing here. But, you know, as we go down the dais here, Please read that enough times to, to answer the question, are you okay with that? I'm not struggling with that one bit. Susan. No, I'm not struggling with that either. And frankly, I have to think in my mind that there is some really good faith here in making this just an incredible project. And I, I really believe that we are going to make that happen. I would probably tend to think it would be easier just like with what we're looking at Pacific Ridge, you know, to make, to change that zoning, to move this forward that makes sense that we're not going to be like coming back, you know, and having to mm -hmm. change all that. I mean, that's just going to bog everybody down. And I don't think any of us want to see that happen. Um, so I don't have any heartburn really over any of these proposals. I don't. I mean, I think at this point, 
it would be great if the project was right up on the screen. I mean, visually, it would be so much easier than this and uh, than going through all this to me. But um, this isn't causing me any heartburn. I think it probably, Scott, would make sense to just do the zoning thing for this project and not have to come back and forth. Well, and, you know, make that a bigger deal. So that's my. And kind of on the on on same track as you, Bob. When I read those, we're not talking about changing a zoning code. We're talking about when they look at their plan. Would we? Would it? Would it be more likely that we would accept it and make zoning code changes if necessary? If the pl if the plan engaged the key stake stakeholders, protected the, the, the environment sensitive areas, some of the things you talked talked about then, integrated the business park with the surrounding community. And so forth. And the, my answer is, yeah, I'd like to see those things happen. Now, when I see the plan, and if, and if it does those, maybe I'll consider changing the zoning code. But don't change the zoning code until I know what's up. Mm -hmm. But those are reasonable things to expect. Yeah, I mean, those are sort of motherhood apple pie statements so far as they go. So let's let go on. <laughs> but, but what it's, but the first sentence, or it's really. It's really the heading that says a city on the front end that provides, which implies something's different on the back end. It's not what the bullets say. It's the context in which the 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 title is being said. Well, if, if I could respond to that, Your Honor, um, what we're trying to do is trying to find a way to package this in a way which attracts the very best developers in the country right. to come and be attracted to this site and understand that they're, that this is a viable site. It's not going to get bogged down in process. They, they understand what the development regs are, what the conditions of approval are, what the environmental box is, uh, what the phasing uh, requirements of the, of the city are. So they can come in and they can bring us exercising all the creativity and ingenuity that the marketplace marshals on big complex projects like this that can bring all of that to us in the form of a project proposal. Uh, so it is this front end piece is about reaching out to the marketplace and getting the very best people in this country to be to be our master developer. And it all depends on what the rest of the answer to the other uh, 13 well, questions are. Yeah, Your Honor, if I may. No, actually you may not uh -huh. because everybody's jumping in uh, to try to debate one point again it's gotten back to Scott Carmen's got the floor right now and we'll get back if we have to start the whole thing again I'll start it again but Carmen you're on well I'm, I'm gonna sound like a broken yeah, record I'm, here except I'm, that I'm beginning to almost feel angry, I'm not angry. because uh, apple pie and and it, every one of these s sentences is worded in such a way that you'd be an idiot if you tried to say you didn't approve of what it says. And I feel manipulated. I like to see open-ended comments that are written in such a way that they leave you feeling okay to say whatever you really think, not to try to lead you to believe, well, I have to say yes to that because it, it, it just makes so much sense. I don't like this. Um, I'm going to make the same comment I made last time. The port has had 20 years of owning that property, studying, having <coughs> different things drawn by consultants so that they know where every tree is, they know what the topography is. They're going to have to give that information to a developer if they want the developer to understand what he's dealing with. And I want to know up front, incrementally, those things that matter to us before we have to make decisions on them. I want to know what footprint of that land they intend to do something with, whether they're going to remove all the trees, whether they aren't, whether they're going to move thousands of cubic yards of dirt, whether they aren't. And I don't like the idea of being told that we have to do a big long-term concept without knowing the basics first. And, and I just am not comfortable where this is going. Tony. Oh. 
Part of the problem that we have here, <clears throat> if you take a look at the draft resolution we provided you, is that we have nothing as an example to show you for Section 3, Section 4. What are you looking at, Tom? I'm looking at the attachment to the agenda item. We gave you a draft resolution. And with, with a I whole lot that, of blank. I see that the, the Mayor Pro Tem has circled those. What we're asking you to do is allow us to give you the filling in of all those blanks as to how this process would work and how you would create the development box that Grant keeps talking about, what the, the conditions of approval would look like, how dealing with the questions that you're coming up with, uh, Council Member Scott, regarding the footprints and, and the, the moving of dirt and, and some of those other type of issues. It's a fundamentally different way of looking at it rather than a prescriptive approach of saying this is how it, it needs to look. What we're asking for is a performance-based approach where we put together, here's what it is we're trying to accomplish in the end, here's how we draw a box around it, and if the developer can come in and creatively get to where you want to be at the end, there's some flexibility in there for him in the way he creates his master plan. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the impression I've got. Uh, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and, the, and the, the detail behind these in these documents, the conceptual master plan document and the EIS document, go to, go to great length, kind of talk about the, the effects of different types of development approaches and, and what kind of environmental protections would be required, what kind of environmental mitigation would be required if those particular approaches were taken. So I'm going to propose that we be given an opportunity to fill in some of the boxes in that resolution, either in the way we definitively want you to see them or as good examples of what it might look like, and that might give you a better comfort level. And if you still aren't comfortable with that, we can talk about going back to the way the process is laid out in the code. Well. Okay, so you're saying you're going to fill in items such as a site layout and design deviations, the zoning code deviations, and et cetera. Eventually, it will have to be filled in that way for you to adopt the, the resolution. Yeah. But, but are you saying that you want to go back and give some suggested? What, is, what are you asking? Uh, what we were trying to do is trying to illustrate the, the, the framework within which this council approval would be uh, would be provided, and, and it, it, this is a this is a ex exactly the same format that you used when you did the Blueberry Lane uh, PUD uh, recently. So, and so we didn't just import the conditions of approval and the yeah. development requirements, but yeah. but each of these areas will, can be in as much or as little detail as council desires to set out your conditions for moving this project forward. Well, this is a massive project. This isn't something that is little subdivision oh. and I, I I believe what staff's intention is here is to try to give a green light to a potential developer to come in and start mm -hmm. doing something I, I'm concerned that maybe on the part of the, some council members that this is a process between us versus the port mm -hmm. where it's so much different than that because we're not asking the port to do this we're asking the developer to come in and do this and uh, maybe there's some animosity about in the minds of some here that uh, I'm not trusting, and and I don't, I don't think that's the issue here. I think it's what are we going to do to get a, a decent developer or developers to come in and say, let us make a proposal to you. Oh. Yeah. I, I guess focusing on the resolution, um, using the Blueberry Lane as an example, they did a modified residential subdivision. And we had a process in the code that says you can modify these five things, and only those five things. I, I guess the legal question I have, which I think our attorney wants to research and comment on, is to what extent can you, by development agreement, unwrite your zoning code? if the zoning code doesn't say these things are deviable. Is that a word? <laughs> well, I think we know where you're going with it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So 
you know, so, so to copy a resolution that had a process that allowed deviation of these five things and substituted in our business park zone, which has no process for modifying anything, you know, has a huge legal question on the top of it. To, to what extent can a development agreement rewrite the zoning code? So, so to me, that's a legal question that needs to be answered right at the start before we walk down this road, because certainly this resolution implies that they're asking for deviations to the code and suggests that we're going to be agreeable to those. Okay. That is, that is a good point, and probably Pat's going to have to provide that. Okay. Answer to us. Let me just interrupt you yeah. for just a second here. Um, all right, we're caught in the quagmire again. We're stuck in the mud. Okay, we are right now. Believe me. I'm ready to go. Um, I, I, yeah. Huh? I'd like to make a comment. Okay, if I could. Sure. Uh, when I read through these, and I've, I've heard several people basically say, you know, we're not. We're essentially saying to a developer. The city is, is, and I guess the port, I mean, but this is the city speaking, is looking for these kinds of things. And if you develop a plan that provides, the, that provides these kinds of things, we will consider uh, them seriously. If that means there's only code change, we, and, and we, so we may. But this, this is providing guidance as to the kind of development we're looking for. And it just stops there. I don't. I don't see why we have to yeah. get all nitpicky about changes that we don't even know we're going to have to make. I, I, I you got me on your side on that one. <laughs> but, well, no. Let me let me <laughs> let me do something with you guys here. You know, it is getting a little late. Let me suggest something to you. We have a month here that has five Thursdays in it. I didn't want to bring this up, but you know, if we want to, we can dedicate an entire Thursday to just this issue and get through it but uh, and we can do that too Dan we can start it start this at the beginning of the meeting rather than the end well that no, the whole meeting uh, yeah. I have an, I have one extra Thursday in this month that I can give the dedicate an entire meeting to it mm -hmm. the, the way I ask the question Bob we need to wait a minute let me hear from the rest we're talking about a set of concepts that we would support th this facility, you know, having or, 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 or contributing to. And that's what the staff is asking. Are these the kinds of things you, you, you'd yeah, like to see? Here's my challenge. And, and why do we want to spend a, a whole meeting trying to refine the concepts? Yeah, you, I agree with you, you don't. I but don't here's, here's where the challenge is coming. My challenge to the council is to go through each and every one of these between now and a, a special maybe meeting and answer the question. And I'm going to say, I'm going to ask everybody, what's your answer? Well, maybe that's not what okay, let's do it. Do. Then you're not going to get through this tonight, Susan. Well, I know, but I'm not saying that's what, I don't want to have a whole meeting. <sighs> well, of course you don't. You never do. But One's okay. I approve. Number two. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, number two. Okay, oh, two. Man, this is total cost. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Um, on that resolution, the, the section four that Tony suggests we fill in, what the council was given a copy of the EIS and told not to talk about it with anybody. And I would guess most of us hasn't read it. And buried inside that are the kernels of stuff, questions that would concern Carmen and I about the size and shape of the box that we're being asked about. So, so I think a very productive meeting would be for you to walk us through the EIS, show us what it says the environmental concerns are for traffic, for stormwater, for earth and grade, so we can start thinking about the approval conditions that we're comfortable with because because that's what's missing right now I haven't read the EIS because you told me not to and not to talk to anybody and, and, and it's I would, sitting there on the shelf I, I I like that idea and I would add 
a second part to that, walk you through the certain aspects of the EIS for some of the things that we want to put into that section four and then t show you what they would look like, give you some draft language so you can understand how what's in the EIS would tie into what's in the resolution. Yes. Now, some of the policy questions that you asked, and I'll move to extend to 11. Oh, yeah, I like that's going to really do anything. Second. <laughs> All in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. If, if we're going to have an, another meeting, I didn't even look over there. All those in favor of extending the meeting, please raise your right hand and say aye. All opposed. <laughs> okay. Can, can that I, takes care of that. Can I tag a comment on to what Scott was saying? <laughs> you got four minutes. Uh, along the same lines as what Scott, if, if somewhere in that EIS there is a topographic map that shows the the stream, the top of the slopes, the, the, the setbacks, the buffers, and I saw one and it had them outlined so I knew where they were, I would be much more content because then I would know if the port came to us with something whether it differed, whether it respected those, whether it was asking us to change them, maybe it's in there. Maybe we just, I, I, I don't know where to look for it. Uh, I'm a very visual person. I, huh? I have to know what I'm trying to respond to. Yes. We, we, can, we can do all those things, Your Honor. I know. I know. We're just not going to do them tonight. All right, Council, you, know, you have a couple minutes. What would you like me to do? Move to adjourn. No, would you, you want me to schedule a meeting for this dedicated to it? Yes. I heard a yes. Do I have any more yeses? I'll second yes. <laughs> Consider it done. I'll do it. You don't need a motion on it. I'll just do it. <laughs> so that's. And don't schedule any committee meetings before or anything. No, absolutely not. That's and I'll be in contact with each one of you to find out what time you'd best like to have it. Uh, it'll be more in the mode of a uh, kind of like a mini retreat only here at the council chambers. On the 31st? If you want dinner, I'll get you dinner. I do not care. But I'll dedicate it to this subject. And it won't be next Thursday. It won't be next Thursday. But I'll call you and let you know which one it is. Probably the one after that, which would be, well, wait a minute, could be next Thursday. I'll be in contact with you. Okay? i got to check your schedules first. And we need to make sure we can provide you all the detail and the right. examples you'll need to be able to Correct. correction. Correct. All right. Uh, that does it. We've got two minutes left. Anybody want to? Uh, uh, well, there's a potential we'll meet next Thursday. Yes, there's a potential. So we're not going to cancel next Thursday. No. Yet. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll say something Go ahead. Yep. about this matter, um, and that is that this is very important what happens here. It is. Um, I think it's important that the council members, uh, that all of us, as, as we have concerns, that we address those, and, and I don't want to make uh, light of any of them, and I guess, Tony you and Grant, you need to know where, where each of us are, have concerns so they can be addressed, taken care of. And I'd like to, you know, move forward with this, though. Let's not have this get stuck in the sand because it's too important to our city for this to go forward. There's we, the opportunities here now. Dan, Kurt, what, 15 seconds. And I, I just don't want to see it delayed. I, I, let's get a good project, but let's move forward and not get stuck in the sand. Thank you. Well said. Very well said. With that, we are adjourned.